Good morning, everyone. Uh, we appreciate your attendance today, being here for the uh, 2020 Ginger and Turmeric uh, Workshop in place of the field day that we normally have, kind of when we're at the farm, at Randolph Farm at Virginia State and, and uh, meeting there. But because of circumstances, we're doing this. And I think this is gonna be very good. So we're excited to have all of you all join us today. As you see, we've got a, a full couple of hours together. Um, and you can see the, uh, the agenda here with the time frame. These are gonna be relatively short presentations with a little bit of time for question and answer at the end of each presentation. Um, also, this, uh, this Zoom meeting today will be recorded and we'll get you that address. Uh, and it's gonna be recorded and uh, probably it's gonna take us about two weeks to do the closed captioning, but then it'll be up on the Virginia State University College of Agriculture YouTube page. So if you, one simple way to find it is to go to YouTube and just uh, type in VSU College of Agriculture. Uh, so hopefully, you know, if you have to uh, um, uh, leave in the middle of this, you'll be able to catch the rest of it uh, on that recorded session. So um, I'm going to ask everybody out there that's watching, uh, mostly everybody's going to be muted anyway, and I'll ask the speakers to make sure that you unmute yourself when you start to, when you start to speak. Um, and other than that, we have a chat section uh, on Zoom. If you, if you go to, uh, to the bottom, towards the bottom of your page or, or however you're uh, connecting, somewhere on your, on your device, you're gonna find a chat session or Q and A area where you can type in a question and we'll be monitoring that. And also, um, if you really uh, want to, you can raise your hand. There's a hand button there and we can let you ask a question live. We can unmute you and let you ask that question live. So we're going to go ahead and get started because we've got a lot. We've got seven speakers, great speakers. Uh, Dr. Reza Rafi uh, has um, done another great job putting together um, a, a great group of speakers. And uh, Reza, and I, Reza mentioned earlier, this is our 12th uh, year of doing this. Uh, so it's uh, a lot of ginger and turmeric uh, work going on here. So I'm going to, with that, I'm going to introduce Dr. Reza Rafi, and he's going to start us off talking about growing ginger. And Reza, I am going to hand it over to you right now. Um. Hello, can you hear me, Chris? Yes, I can hear you. So just if you wanted to just share your presentation, we're, we're ready to go. Yeah, good, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you to all of you from uh, wherever you are for joining us. Um, this is Reza Rafi. I'm an extension specialist at Virginia State University. Uh, as Chris mentioned, we, we have done quite a bit of work with Ginger for the last um, 11, 12 years at VSU. And many of you have participated at our Ginger conferences in the past. So today I'm going to take a different approach. Uh, there are different ways of growing Ginger. So I'm going to go ahead, uh, right, get right to that concept of uh, growing different growing uh, growing different ways of growing ginger anyway so this basics of the ginger is a tropical plants uh, originally from asia and um, uh, raise a, the plant raise a, let me just say oh, 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 oh. raise let me interrupt we can't we can't see your screen Let's just make sure you can. Okay, hold on. Yep. All right. Let's see. Let me where is where am I? Where am I sharing my? Not yet. Uh, let's see. Thank you. 
Okay, we can see it. Just go ahead and put it in slideshow mode. There you go. Sorry about that. I was just talking to myself. But uh, but anyway, so can you hear me okay too? Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, so yeah, let me let me go ahead and uh, talk about the sustainable ginger production. Market is definitely important. Um, ninety uh, ninety percent or eighty five percent of the ginger consumed in the U.S. comes from China. Due to the COVID uh, nineteen and the current situation, the trade situation between the U.S. and China, that definitely there is huge market potential for expansion, future expansion, large scale expansion of ginger. So the market is not an issue for the future of ginger. And another issue which is, which is extremely important is the selection of seed pieces. If you decide to start growing ginger, definitely seed piece selection, which is a piece of the rhizome, that's what we call seed piece, that is definitely a huge, huge important in the process. It needs to be mature, disease-free seed piece and minimum of two ounces. That's, uh, you need a good uh, size seed piece to be able to get um, a good size plant and hopefully have a good size, uh, good amount of ginger at the end. And disease management is really, really critical in the ginger production. Uh, Dr. Mershaw, our oncologist, would um, on that, but uh, because ginger is produced uh, vegetatively, so it's really, really um, vulnerable to the diseases. Again, he's going to discuss that in detail. And then uh, one thing that is really important is that uh, ginger is a heavy feeder and it will deplete your soil. Fertilizer and organic matter are critical in the ginger production. So uh, our experience have shown that in order to be able to obtain marketable and really big size rhizome, you need to feed it and feed it uh, as much as you can. I cannot uh, emphasize enough uh, of the importance of fertilizer in the ginger production. So you need to be really uh, um, generous when it comes to using fertilizer and applying fertilizer. And then uh, it is really important to mount your plant to cover the rhizome Otherwise, you'll be uh, marketing partially green ginger. On the other hand, ginger it has a tendency to grow up and that rhizome comes out of the soil. It's really important to be able to cover that. And then plant spacing, we usually use three and three to four feet between rows and two feet uh, space between plants in the same row. Shade is really, really important. I show some slides for the end. Rotation, because of the disease problem that we have, we experience during the production, really important to, uh, to take into account that rotation. Five years is the best, because once the diseases, soil-borne diseases get into the soil, it's really hard to get rid of it. That rotation five, but four to five years, uh, going back to the same spot for planting is really, really very helpful. And, and also, uh, what is really important is the photoperiod Ginger is a photoperiod sensitive crop. That means uh, the foliage development, uh, the vegetative development must be during the long days. So if you plant your ginger crop late and then that vegetative uh, stage comes late in the summer or in fall, when days are getting short, you definitely will have smaller rhizome sizes. So that's, uh, that's something that you need to uh, take into account. This is a this is a um, picture of the uh, rhizomes or seed pieces. I took this picture from Paul Pepperly from the University of Hawaii. Uh, these are two ounces uh, fresh-looking ginger, as you could see, um, and 
minimum of two eyes on those ginger seed pieces. Um, this characteristic of the seed piece or uh, seed rhizome or seed pieces is mature, clean, disease-free ginger. Uh, cut the selected hands into two to four ounces. Um, and uh, with um, a knife, you sterilize the knife after each cut. Uh, each seed pieces uh, um, uh, must have between two to four well-developed eyes. Uh, and then uh, we use, usually after, during the cutting of seed pieces, we use uh, um, a bleach uh, to be able to really maintain, disinfect um, the knife every time we do the cut. And then after you do the cut, when you're preparing your seed pieces, you really need to uh, let that uh, spot where you do the cutting to, uh, to stay clean and stay dries out before you start planting. These are some of the seed pieces that at our own uh, uh, re research station at Randolph Farm. Uh, these are, as you could see, they're mature. They're not baby ginger. It's something that a lot of farmers in Virginia ground. These are, uh, and then a picture in the uh, lower part, these are all the old disease ginger that you definitely don't want to uh, plant this because of uh, you'll be disappointed uh, with, uh, with, the, with the result. The upper part of the picture are good quality, good size seed pieces with a couple of eyes at least on each seed piece. And then this is how we produce a seedling. Uh, for our transplant, we use uh, we, in the, in February. Uh, we usually use uh, uh, potting mix, and uh, um, we fill up the uh, one gallon pots uh, to half or three fourths filled with that uh, potting mix, and then we plant our uh, ginger seed piece in there. And then one thing that is really important is. If that seed piece stays in a cool temperature area, it, it, it does not sprout quickly. In general, it takes probably between three to four weeks, but the, uh, some growers are using a heating pad under those, uh, under those uh, pots to be able to stimulate uh, the temperature of the soil so they sprout. So that is really, really important. And then the picture on the right side of the screen are uh, seedlings uh, that we have uh, in May, uh, in mid-April or May, those are, those are ready to go to the, to the high tone, depending where you are and the, what temperature uh, you're experiencing inside the high tone. But be careful, uh, they don't like, um, Cool temperature, particularly at the early stages of their lives, you just want to make sure that the temperature of 65, 70 degree when you start planting them in your high tunnel. Now, this is different ways of uh, growing ginger that we have experienced at Randall Farm. I will share that quickly with you. Uh, this is uh, transplanting them in the high tunnel. This is the way we used to grow our ginger. It's very good. We use a lot of mushroom compost, make those. Uh, and make those uh, furrows or uh, and uh, ditches. Uh, we use that um, that uh, hand handheld uh, tractor, and then we use a lot of mushroom compost, as I said, and then uh, cover that mushroom compost with a little bit of uh, soil. And before we put that, uh, we put uh, the the transplant or the seedling in there and we cover that. Uh, so this is on um, your, you could see it's covered and then we lay down the irrigation and so on. This has been really interesting experience. If this is in May and August and in September, uh, you could see um, the development of the of this of this. But let me let me just go back to this. Uh, one of the disadvantages that we have experienced growing it directly in soil. Uh, transplanting them, the seedling in soil, is if that soil inside the high tunnel has a real 
extensive piece of real estate um, that infected the diseases which they usually do over time, then you don't have much option to be able to provide that to a patient. So, uh, so you just need to be aware of the fact growing ginger in soil inside the high tunnel, you always have that a challenge of maintain disease development and rotation issue. So this is another way that we grow our ginger. Um, this is in uh, transplanting seedling in grow bag. Uh, the result for this is incredible. I have a short video that I'll show you in a few minutes. They use uh, a mixture, that substrate that we use with those grow bags are, are a mixture of uh, potting mix, we use a compost, a mushroom compost and pine or mulch and mix that. And then we fill up uh, the, the grow bag and then we transplant uh, the seedling inside of that. You can see we started in May 13, transplanting them. That's the lower picture in July 21st. And then this is a picture that you could see the gradual development of those. I took this picture yesterday. You could see there isn't enough space to be able to walk inside that tunnel. Um, uh, so that the, the picture on the left-hand side is uh, because at the beginning I mentioned you need to feed it and you need to feed your ginger plants. Uh, really uh, be, be very generous in terms of the fertilizer. That, uh, spray a stake that you could see the water individually, you water that and then we use quite a bit of uh, osmocote fertilizer to be able to feed it and just make sure that we get enough. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, show you a, a quick video of, of this. Uh, this. This is a tunnel at Virginia State University Randall Farm, where we grow our ginger in grow bags. It has been a very good experience growing ginger in grow bags. There are six different varieties of ginger in this tunnel. They are named based on where they came from or their characteristics. Today is October 6, 2020. It is a too early to harvest ginger in Virginia. However, we are harvesting a plant to show you. of fresh marketable baby ginger from one plant uh, washed clean packed ready for the market anyway so that was uh, that was one way of the, of doing it but recently this past couple of years uh, we decided to uh, because it really is limited in terms of growing in space in the high tunnel is expensive not everyone has it so we decided to move it outside and this is, uh, this is this year, we've done it, we did it last year, and this is this year transplanting in raised bed outside. And this is the process that you could see in July 1st, and then you could see on, excuse me, uh, on October 21st, uh, yesterday, 
I uh, went in there and we harvested some, and these are the, the there is, uh, we harvested some three, uh, three days ago, it was like 10 pounds, and then we harvested one yesterday that was three pounds. So there are quite a bit of variation in terms of production, growing it outside. This has a lot of potential transplanting seedlings outside in raised beds. So I just, I have a quick video to show you just what we have uh, uh, from, from this. <laughs> This is a different way of growing ginger. We're growing ginger outside in uh, on the raised bed. So with the ginger are transplanted in, on this, into this raised bed in uh, between May and June when the weather outside is not, it's not really cold. So we're going to show you the procedures of harvesting. the ginger that was harvested from those raised beds. Fresh baby ginger washed, grown in the, on the raised bed, in the produce box, mm -hmm. ready to go to the and market. The second way, uh, obviously, um, you have to work with transplant. And that transplant process takes quite a bit of time and energy and resources to start in, uh, in February. And that time period and resources that you put into that transplant production is considerable. But though, so this, uh, this year, uh, we started growing them in the field um, with seed pieces. And so this is uh, a couple of uh, places that is, uh, uh, that we have it at our own uh, Randolph farm. And then in another grower farm, we try to set up a small area, just planting the seed. As you could probably see this distance between those two, uh, from one seed piece to another seed, it usually leave two, uh, two feet, uh, feet apart. But so this is this is uh, some of that process you could see in June. We planted them in April, if you notice, because in April and June it sits in there forever because it's cold. Like the, the soil is cool and it doesn't sprout until until probably sometime beginning of the June. So this is uh, that first row you could see it's mulch and the other one is the raised bed. On the side you could see uh, we planted we planted corn, sweet corn just to be able to provide shades. Um, as I mentioned, it requires, it really needs that, that shade. So this is uh, some of the result that we have on October 22nd, 21st, we harvested is two pounds. And then from the other one, it was like three pounds marketable uh, ginger from direct seed. Again, due to COVID-19, we really haven't been able to, um, to go in there and kind of do what requires to look at it in detail. But we're hoping from now on to be able to harvest um, some of these ginger plants and be able to provide solid observation in terms of the research data and share that eventually with you later on. Uh, so fertilizer application, as I mentioned, it's really, really important to be able to apply and be generous. There is a website from the University of Hawaii uh, for feeding your Ginger, so I wouldn't go into the detail of that. This is the mounding issue that I mentioned. We want to make sure you, from end of July uh, all the way to harvest, you need to get out there periodically and uh, check on that ginger to make sure you cover that rhizome which is coming up. Again, shade is really, really important. You want to make sure that afternoon sun doesn't uh, doesn't uh, hit directly your ginger. These are, these are a couple of 
picture that you see a 25, 30% shade uh, in growing the ginger in the field. But be aware, if you grow them in the high tunnel, that plastic, that structure provides enough shade. You don't need to provide additional sh shade when you grow them in the, inside the high tunnel. Again, many people are interested in uh, producing their own rhizomes uh, for a seed and planting. Uh, we need to protect it uh, because we usually start harvesting uh, in mid-October all the way to, uh, to first frost. And then when first frost comes, it really kills the top. It doesn't go anymore. If you're going to the market, you need to harvest it and sending it to the market. But if you decide to leave some of those uh, plants for uh, to mature them enough to be able to get seed, you need to provide additional covering and sometimes the heater to be able to help that plant continue growing all the way to December. And these are mature seeds. Uh, these are a few years ago that we took, uh, we took this picture. These are mature seed uh, in December and then we harvest them, um, take them to the greenhouse and, and let them dry out and then we use them as seed pieces for the future. Um, this is uh, this is the last slide, uh, slide I share with you. This is a mature at Rambal farm. You could see the seed pieces for the production. So I think that's that's basically it, Chris. I have if any, there's any questions, happy to uh, happy to answer. Otherwise, good to go to the next speaker. Thank you, Reza. I, I think there are some questions, and I think what we might do for the sake of time is to maybe, Reza, if you can stick around maybe after, at the end of everybody's, and we'll, we'll ask some of these. Uh, there was a question about whether these slides will be available. They will be on our, uh, this whole presentation uh, today uh, will be on our um, VSU College of Agriculture uh, YouTube channel. So I, I will, we will get to these questions and uh, we'll just, we'll add probably at the end, but for the sake of time, uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna turn it over right now to our next presenter talking about the health benefits of ginger, Dr. Siddiqui, who's here in the uh, Ag Research Station at Virginia State University. So Dr. Siddiqui, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks, Chris. Um... All right, okay. Um, so I'm gonna talk about some of the health benefits of ginger and basically we'll show some of our data for characterizing different varieties of ginger. Uh, and we'll show some, some data you know, comparing the baby versus uh, mature ginger. Now, ginger uh, is, uh, is a, actually a flowering plant, uh, uh, but its root, which is typically called as ginger, is uh, widely used as a spice and uh, and traditionally in like folk culture, it has been uh, used to remedy certain uh, diseases. As Dr. Rafi just mentioned, uh, ginger is basically native to Southeast Asia, but it is now cultivated all over the world now um, because there is a increased demand of ginger everywhere. I mean, ginger market is steadily growing and is expected to reach about 4.6 million tons in, uh, by 2025. Uh, most of the ginger which is produced is, uh, is produced by, uh, world, the world supply of ginger is produced by six, this, these six countries, India, China, and Nigeria. Nigeria, like 10 years ago, it was like at uh, number 11, but now it's moved to number three. Uh, so there's a lot of interest in growing ginger. And um, like in USA, we use a lot of ginger. So we, is, we, we, we are the, one of the highest users of ginger. And as Dr. Rafi, Rafi said, that, you know, um, there's a great potential of growing ginger here because there's a big market of uh, ginger consumption here. So there are about like 1500 different varieties of ginger. Uh, not every ginger is uh, edible. Uh, some of the ginger are grown for uh, their uh, flowering. Um, and they, they produce beautiful uh, flowers. Some uh, gingers, they are edible, uh, but uh, most of the ginger which are growing in the wild, they are not edible and some are in toxin. Um, 
there are a lot of health benefits of ginger. And as I'll show you, like uh, it has been used for different ailments like uh, preventing cancer, uh, recovering from digestive disorders, uh, use as an anti-inflammatory compound, using for weight loss, and again, for certain other elements like nausea. I will go some of these health benefits in, in a little bit in detail. Um, one of the very common use of ginger is to prevent uh, or to relieve the cold symptoms. And studies have shown that ginger has been used, um, uh, actually ginger has activity against respiratory, common respiratory viruses. Uh, it has also been shown that it inhibits uh, the common influenza virus like H9N2. Uh, there is no data about COVID-19, but because ginger has anti-inflammatory properties and one of the uh, effects of ginger is in the lungs, so it may be beneficial for patients who are uh, having symptoms of uh, COVID-19. Uh, other use of ginger is uh, also commonly used to prevent nausea and morning sickness, for especially for pregnant women. Uh, uh, there are things which are available uh, uh, derived from ginger extract that can be used to prevent morning sickness and, and nausea. There are like you know like travel you know these ginger gums for people who feel sick while they are um, while they are traveling. Um, one of the nausea and vomiting is associated, uh, is very common uh, in patients which are going into chemotherapy. Uh, and uh, it's, the studies have shown that just using one gram per day ginger for about three days would reduce about 60% of the symptoms associated with the chemotherapy, like mostly like nausea. And about in 80% cases, uh, it reduced the fatigue, which is associated with the chemotherapy. Uh, ginger has also been used for curing indigestion. It actually has a lot of benefits for, uh, like it's, it, it is regarded as gastroprotective. It has been shown to use against like constipation, dyspepsia, belching, bloating, gastritis, epigastric discomfort, gastric isolation, indigestion, nausea, and vomiting. So it has. Uh, is commonly used to prevent uh, some of the gastrointestinal uh, uh, things. It has anti-inflammatory properties used against muscle pain. It has shown to reduce blood glucose as well as reduce the uh, blood pressure. So it's good for uh, diabetes and controlling the blood pressure. One of the health benefits of uh, ginger is lowering the cholesterol. And as we know that cholesterol deposit in our arteries, which kind of narrowing down the arteries and causes blood pressure and ultimately kind of oculate the arteries and, uh, and, and lead to heart failure. So it's uh, also has been shown to have certain benefits for atherosclerosis and uh, preventing cardiac diseases. Osteoarthritis is also an inflammatory disease. There is shown um, a joint with, uh, with inflammation and there are products which are developed to relieve that kind of pain. Lungs, um, as I have said earlier, the ginger, because of its anti-inflammatory properties, it reduces inflammation. It speeds up the respiratory infection, as well as it reduces the mucus uh, deposition, which kind of clog the bronchial ar arteries or bronchial tubes. Uh, and this is one of the symptoms that mucus, excessive mucus is developed during COVID-19, which kind of uh, block the arteries, that's why Patient, you know, COVID patient need the uh, respirators uh, to increase the oxygen uh, in their uh, in their blood. So one of the effects ginger does is that it reduces this mucus formation in lungs. Uh, most of these health benefits of ginger are because of its uh, uh, because of the compounds which are present in ginger. The compounds are basically divided into volatiles and non-volatiles. Volatile compounds are it, uh, these are the compounds which uh, are responsible for the smell and the pungency in ginger. Whereas uh, the non-volatile compounds, they are they provide most of the health benefits. And some of these compounds are these like sick gingerol, shogaol, uh, peridol, zingiron, and uh, dehydrogingeron. Um, and most of the effects of ginger, they are attributed because of this uh, antioxidation activity. 
So what we done is basically uh, we determine variation in the antioxidation properties of ginger among different varieties. And we also compare when the ginger harvested early as well as compare when they harvested late. Um, and uh, some of, we have some of the data characterizing its anti-obesity properties. So basically with the ginger um, which are grown at our rental farm, we have four different varieties like blue ginger. It is called blue ginger because of this uh, a blue ring. Um, when you cut it, uh, you see this characteristic blue ring. Indian ginger, uh, yellow ginger, which is very, very yellow and the white uh, or the Chinese ginger which is also called as white ginger is because it produces white flowers, but it's still the color most of the time is like, you know, whitish to yellowish. Um, we have we've been doing experiments on ginger uh, since uh, 2017. We had then the first trial where we kind of compare baby versus um, uh, mature ginger. Then we repeated uh, the trial again, just to see the seasonal variation. And recently we are doing, uh, we testing these four different varieties. Uh, so we, we harvested these by weekly starting from October, uh, which is like almost like about eight months since they started sprouting. And uh, these samples were freeze dried, grounded, and then extracted in methanol. And we, then we determined the uh, total polyphenolic contents, antioxidation activity, and their anti-obesity activity. Now, most of the data earlier earlier data we have is on white ginger, and that's how it looks like. So when we harvest ginger at week one, uh, like that was almost like approximately eight months uh, in early October, it looks like this. It's like a you know which is we typically call as baby ginger. It is it has no skin or very papery, very thin skin. It looks like this, and at time passes, it's become like you know 18 weeks when. It, it, like, like a last harvest we do, which is like early January, it looks like this. It's a very thick coat, uh, it's a brownish in color. Um, and uh, so what we did, we determined the total phenolic contents. And what we found that when we harvest the ginger a week, a, you know, a week one, um, we have the highest phenolic content, content in the baby ginger, but as time passes, the content decreases and we have almost like 50% less phenolic compound when we harvest as a, as a mature ginger. Now, uh, we also measure the antioxidation activity using two different methods like DPPH and ABTS. Uh, they use like, you know, it is a very well known antioxidation uh, assays. In both assays, you know, it, is, it follows the same pattern. We have high antioxidation activity when we harvest early it reduces as time passes and at maturity, we have almost like, you know, 60 to 50, 50 to 60% decrease in antioxidation activity. We also done the antioxidation activity in cell because those are the chemical assays. So we treated cells, cells make, you know, oxidants and we treated with ginger and see if we can reduce the antioxidant production. And it's the, almost the same pattern that, you know, it has a high, Baby ginger has high antioxidation activity compared to the uh, mature ginger. We also extracted the ginger uh, compounds. We examined uh, the key ginger components and they follow the same pattern, like the main component the, which are present in, in excess is six ginger oil. And again, it's, it's high in baby ginger and it decreases as uh, ginger matures and has almost like 50% less when um, in mature ginger compared to baby ginger. Again, the same compound, other compound like sperodol and six sugar oil, they follow this similar pattern. Um, seasonal variation, we compare 2017 and 2018 samples and they are pretty much identical. Um, they follow the same pattern, like you know, we have more polyphenols in baby ginger compared to mature ginger. And this is the data sorry, uh, on the different ginger varieties. So we have four different varieties, blue ring, Indian yellow, and Chinese uh, white ginger. They follow the same pattern except yellow ginger. Yellow ginger is, uh, does not really changes very much compared to other ginger. So it, this is the, you know, summarized data that the blue ring, Indian, and Chinese ginger 
So this is week one compared to week 15. The phenolic contents are greatly reduced in all these three varieties, but in yellow uh, ginger, it's only slightly reduced, not very much compared to other varieties. <clears throat> And this is the antioxidation activity. Again, they, they all follow the same, but not the yellow ginger, which is kind of decreased a little bit, not that much. And this is again, the summarized data of antioxidation activity. So the blue ring ginger, Indian, and the Chinese white, they, I mean, the baby ginger has a lot more antioxidation activity compared to the mature ginger. But in case of yellow, the mature and uh, a baby and mature ginger, you know, they are not that much different. Now I'm gonna switch and, and uh, go over some of the data we have on uh, obesity. Now we know that obesity is a problem. This problem globally is, um, is the data from 2018, um, where the obesity is, um, is, 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 is growing. And obesity also has a problem in, um, in USA. The leanest people you find is like in Colorado. The, the, the most obese people we find in uh, West Virginia, which are our neighbor and we are getting there. So this is a little bit old data. Now the uh, incidence, obesity incidence in Virginia is, is over 30% now. So it's still increasing. Now obesity is just not a, you know, gaining weight, but obesity has a lot more, uh, uh, is associated with a lot other complication especially with coronary heart diseases. There are multiple you know, things which, are, which lead to coronary heart diseases, as well as uh, liver. We get fatty liver and there are a number of things which are associated uh, with fatty liver ending into cirrhosis and ultimately hepatocellular carcinoma. So these are two serious. In addition to these, uh, obesity is also linked to, to cancer formation and other you know, uh, lung diseases and strokes and you know, other complications. So it's, um, there's a lot of efforts to prevent the obesity. So what we did, we tried to see the effects of uh, ginger on obesity. We use this cellular model where we use this 33 L1 cells. These cells are pre-adipocytes. So these are not, not adipocytes, but if you grow these cells in high glucose concentration in the presence of insulin and some like, you know, cortisone, some steroids. So this is a condition mimicking a person which is eating like a high fat diet or using like a McDonald's or Burger King diet for a long time. So these premature adipocytes, they convert into adipocytes. So we make the adipocytes by growing in a, in a diet which is typically represent like a high fat diet or high glucose diet. Um, and uh, so these adipocytes then we use, so we use like, you know, um, pre-adipocyte, adipocyte not treated with ginger or treated with ginger extract using two different doses like 25 microgram per ml and 50 microgram per ml. And then we analyze the fat deposition, lipid formation. So what happens that all this glucose and fatty acid that goes into metabolize in our system, at the end, they form this lipid droplets. So we measure the lipid droplets and that's how they look. So this is the pre-adipocytes you can see here in, in um, there, there's only a small amount of lipid, which is 10 like a, like a red in here. When we grow them in, um, in a typical McDonald's diet, see, it is like loaded with oil. So these fats, they deposit oil. But when we treat them with the, these adipocytes with ginger, like 25 microgram and 50 microgram here, so you can see that all deposition is reduced greatly. This is 25 and this is like you know, 50 micrograms. So you know, compared to this, it is like it's substantially reduced. So what we did, we expected this oil and quantitatively measured. And here is like uh, uninduced, we don't see much lipid formation there. This is the, the fat cell. And when we treat with 25, 50 microgram of ginger, you can see gradual decrease in lipid droplet formation. And this is like, you know, almost like 30% decrease in lipid, oil lipid deposition. And these droplets are nothing, but they are packets of uh, triglycerides. And um, so we also measured the triglyceride formation. And again, we found the reduction, you know, high dose of uh, ginger substantially or statistically significantly re reduced triglyceride formation there. Um, then we looked into the mechanism. Uh, we looked for the regulatory genes which are involved in fat synthesis. 
what happens that this is a pre-adipocytes. When it converts into adipocytes, there are some early genes which basically kicks the pre-adipocytes towards adipocyte conversion. And then we have the other genes which involve in fat synthesis. They, they get kicked in later on and net result is we get a lot more dip, dip, uh, deposition. So the gene which involved in adipogenesis, what well, we found that uh, the gene, early gene like CBEP and PPAR gamma, they, their expression is reduced substantially in the presence of higher doses dose of ginger extract like 50 microgram. In lipogenesis, what happens? The glucose is ultimately converted into triglycerides. Glucose undergoes into glycolysis, like acetyl CoA and oxaloacetate. Oxaloacetate eventually leads to conversion of cholesterol. Whereas acetyl CoA leads the formation of fatty acid. This fatty acid and cholesterol they combine together and they form triglycerides. So these are the two en enzymes which kind of regulate the flux into going into triglycerides. And what we found that ginger also inhibit phosphoenol pyruvate carboxykinase as well as acetyl CoA carboxylase, which kind of the activity is significantly reduced. And these are the enzyme here which kind of phase the glucose into triglyceride formation. That's how we were able to see decrease in triglyceride formation. So just to conclude, what we found that um, the phenolic content and antioxidation anti activity was highest in the baby ginger compared to mature ginger. The phenolic content and antioxidation activity decrease as uh, ginger gets mature and we found almost like 50% decrease in uh, phenolic content and antioxidation activity. One more thing which I forgot to add here is that uh, we found that, uh, you know, there's uh, not much seasonal variation, it's find similar effect, and then different varieties are almost like similar, except the yellow ginger, which do not vary in, in the phenolic content and uh, antioxidation activity between like um, uh, baby ginger and mature ginger. The other thing we found is the major uh, the ginger extract, they inhibit uh, fat accumulation in adipose cells. It has a tremendous potential to be effective as in uh, uh, against uh, obesity. So I will stop here and uh, I'd like to acknowledge the person, uh, my research scientist, Ivan Lee, who performs some of this work. And I'd like to acknowledge the help of uh, our director, Dr. Mercy and our Dean, Dr. McKinney, who were very supportive of this project. And uh, part of the research was carried out from a grant uh, from Center of Agricultural Research, Engagement and Outreach. Thank you very much for your uh, passion. And uh, if, if there's time, I'd be glad to answer some of the questions. Thank you, Dr. Siddiqui. Um, that was very interesting information you presented. I think what we might do, since the next talk is, has a little bit to do with health also, we might hold, we might ask questions sure. after that talk for both of you. So, so just for the sake, also for the sake of time to move on, I think we'll do that. Um, so I'm gonna ask Dr. Carlin Rafi uh, with Virginia Tech to um, talk to us now about how to use ginger in your daily diet. Dr. Rafi. Hi, everybody. Oops, hold on. So let me show my camera so you all can get a picture of me. Hi, everyone. Uh -huh. Nice. I'm so. Uh, Glad to be here. I'm Carla Raffi. I'm an extension specialist in human nutrition with Virginia Cooperative Extension. And I'm pleased to be with you all today and delighted to present on how you can incorporate this wonderful spice into your daily diet. Um, the previous speakers, Dr. Sadidi in particular, have done a great job of speaking about how to produce ginger and the evidence for its health benefits. For the sake of selling the ginger that you produce in your local market and for individuals to experience those health benefits and the happiness from actually consuming this wonderful spice, we really need to learn to use it in the foods that we traditionally and consistently consume. So that's my charge today is to try to help do that. I hope to present a few practical ways of accomplishing that. Can 
I'm going to quickly stop sharing my screen real quick because I don't think I shared the sound. Hold on just a minute. Let me redo that. So I make sure I can share my computer sound. There you go. Okay. So why should we have ginger as part of our regular daily diets? Well, um, one, of course, there are a couple of good reasons. One is the potential health benefits to us by doing that. And the second is just that it's delicious and that it really is a wonderful spice to use in our foods and in, in the foods that we consume daily. So it's culinary attributes, two good reasons to do that. As presented by Dr. Sadigi, there's good evidence from valid research studies that the active components of ginger have strong antioxidant activity and anti-inflammatory effects on the body. Ginger is a proven anti-emitic, reducing nausea and vomiting under several conditions and is protective of the gastrointestinal tract. In addition, there's evidence that ginger in the diet improves diabetic parameters, such as blood glucose control and insulin levels. And finally, studies have also shown that components in ginger have anti-tumor activity that may impact certain kinds of cancers. And so what, is, what do those properties translate into? They trans, uh, consumption of ginger is associated with a reduction in the pain associated with osteoarthritis and chronic muscle pain, mainly due to its anti-inflammatory properties. It is used in complementary medicine to effectively reduce the nausea associated with pregnancy and motion sickness, as well as as a prophylactic to prevent nausea and vomiting from chemotherapy and postoperatively. It's also been shown to improve blood lipid parameters, lowering triglycerides and the harmful low density lipoproteins and increasing the beneficial high density lipoproteins as well as having evidence to um, decrease blood pressure. And finally, we also talked about diabetes already, but it appears to have positive effects on diabetes blood sugar control. So those are potential health benefits. All good reasons for all of us to be consuming ginger regularly. Ginger, however, is also a wonderful food. It is an essential ingredient of Asian cuisine, <laughs> being a daily component of traditional Chinese, Korean, Japanese, and Indian foods, such as fish, meat, and vegetarian diets. So in Asian cuisine, this is something that's consumed daily. In Western countries, however, ginger is most often associated with sweet foods, such as cakes and cookies, and is more of an occasional part of the diet. Um, as Dr. Sadigi pointed out, we have this increasing obesity rate. And so if this is how we are going to get our ginger by eating all these sweet foods, uh, that wouldn't necessarily be recommended. But we find ginger in the Western culture in beverages like ginger ale, some in ginger tea and ginger liqueurs, as well as familiar sweets like gingerbread, ginger snaps, and other treats. You guys can probably think of some of those that you consume or you make in your own homes. Particularly since slides are not readable. They're not what? Readable, not really? So I, I've been told that, that my slides are not um, very, you can't see my slides effectively. Is that true? Yeah. Carl, Carlin, it's Chris. What we might do is it might be a bandwidth issue. Maybe you want to, let's turn your camera off and see if it's, if it, uh, uh, okay, good. Fixes the slides a little bit. Maybe if you get off also, it'll give me more bandwidth. Let me just quickly see how I can turn my, okay, I'm going to turn my camera off. How's that? So I think we've got two people in my household on this Zoom. So I think uh, Dr. Rafi, the other Dr. Rafi is going to get off the Zoom and maybe that'll give me more bandwidth. Is that a little better? It, it, it went, it was, and then it's, it's there. I think it's going to be good now. I think that'll help once you get uh, both computers, maybe <laughs> one of the computers off. Okay, good, because I'm going to show a video and I'm afraid the video is going to be impacted, but and you all can hear me fine, right? Okay, so um, 
Ginger can be found in the market in various forms. And here I've, I've highlighted a few of them. So you can find ginger fresh, of course. Uh, you can also find it as a dry powder. It's very, very available. You all probably have this on some of your, in some of your spice shelves. Um, it can also be found as a ginger oil, in beverages, candied, as well as being available in kind of in a medicinal form in, in pills. So there's lots of forms of ginger out there in the market. In addition, ginger is recognized as a generally recognized as safe substance by the United States Food and Drug Administration at a daily intake level of up to four grams of the dry product, which is about a little, about an ounce of the fresh ginger on a daily basis. There is not a set amount considered as safe for clinical studies. So you see in clinical studies, a range of quantities of ginger being used in these studies, but there's a general consensus in clinical studies for nausea and vomiting that about a, a thousand milligrams or one gram of dry ginger daily is a safe dose that will impact nausea and vomiting. Now, as a caution, even though it is recognized as generally safe, at very large doses, something that might be considered an overdose, there may be some risk of depression of the central nervous system, bleeding or abnormalities, as well as arrhythmia. So you don't wanna go hog wild with this stuff. So even though it's considered generally safe, you don't want to uh, be excessive, particularly when it's in pill form. So for the sake of our discussion today and, the, and what I'm going to show you in terms of how you can use this in your diet, I thought you might want to figure out what's the equivalent of a dried to a fresh. So um, equivalent to about a thousand milligrams of dried ginger or one gram of dried ginger is five grams of freshly grated ginger. So it's about a five to one ratio, more or less. One gram of dried ginger is equivalent to about two milliliters of a ginger liquid extract. And of course that depends on the concentration of the extract, but more or less two mils. It's equivalent to about two teaspoons of a ginger syrup. And we're gonna talk a little bit about teas. So, um, one gram of dried ginger is equivalent to about four cups of a fresh ginger tea that's made with about two grams of fresh grated ginger steeped for five to ten minutes. One cup of ginger ale has about the equivalent of one milligram of dried ginger and 1,000 milligrams and two pieces of the candied ginger of about one inch square is equivalent to about one gram of ginger consumption a day. So I give you that just so you can estimate more or less how much you have to be eating to be eating within the range that will impact health, but also is under those, um, what's recognized as safe for daily consumption. So now, and I hope this is going to work, Chris, if it doesn't, I'm not sure what we're gonna do, but I have a, a video here of me demonstrating how you can use this in your kitchen. And I'm gonna play that now and hopefully you'll Turn up my sound real quick on my computer so the sound is. We'll get started. Let me, Chris, shout out if for some reason you're not hearing this well or it's not coming through appropriately, okay? All right, well, go ahead and try. We were hearing it at first, we just weren't seeing a video, but go ahead and try. Okay, so can you see my screen now? we can with the ideas for incorporating ginger into your daily diet from our home to yours. We're seeing that screen. Perfect. Okay, so here we go. Now, now we're not. Hi, welcome to From Our Home to Yours, the cooking channel where professionals from Cooperative Extension show you how to cook delicious health-promoting recipes that they love. I'm Carlin Raffi, an Extension Specialist with Virginia Cooperative Extension and a registered no, we're, dietitian. We're, still, we're hearing you, Carlin, but we're not seeing you. Oh, really? You're not seeing the video at all? No, it's, it's just frozen on a slide, but 
we're hearing you, but it's just not no motion. <clears throat> Today, I'm going to show you five you go. ideas to add ginger to your daily diet. And I'm going to start with showing you how to store ginger for easy a button that stops it. use. So ginger actually is very easy to I use what, and Carlin, it's really what, easy what to peel. Do... The first thing, we've washed this already, but you want to take it to the sink and you want to wash it maybe with a brush or something, get all that dirt yeah, off of it. Um, and right. then you want to get this skin off before you want to use it and it's not there are many ways you can do that uh, some people use a spoon to scrape it off and and other people use other ways but i just use the little paring knife i cut off these ends and then you're going to see how easily uh, this skin comes off so you can just scrape either scrape the skin off you can kind of see it just scrapes right off or you can kind of slice it off if you if you prefer to do it that way. But very easy to get the skin off, particularly because this is Virginia grown. It's nice and fresh. It's not it's not old and dry and wrinkly. Uh, this is an easy process to do. So you just go on and and um, get take the skin off. And I've done that with so that we don't have to spend time doing that. I've done that with um, several pieces of ginger. So I have several nice pieces of ginger that I've already peeled and, and taken the skin off and cut off any little bad spots. So we can use that. So then how can you, if you're going to, let's say you're going to buy a lot of ginger and you want to store it for future use, um, there's some really nice ways of storing ginger. If you're growing it yourself and you've just harvested, what are you going to do with all this ginger to keep it fresh? So there's many things that you can do. Uh, of course, you can dry it and there are people who slice them up, put them in a dehydrator and dry them and then store those until you want to use them and grind them up and use them as a powder. So ginger, you can also buy it as a powder in the grocery store. Um, you can also take the whole ginger and put it in a plastic um, freezer container and just freeze it in your freezer. So you can freeze it whole after you've washed it if you'd like. The other way and one way that we do it is you can actually um, uh, shred it or uh, chop it up and then put it in ice trays and freeze it. And that's what we do. So uh, I've already gotten, taken some ginger and I've just put it in my food processor and I've chopped it up. And then basically we just take the chopped ginger, we fill our ice trays with, with the ginger And I've seen uh, other, if you go online, there's all kinds of people giving you wonderful recommendations on how to store your ginger. But I saw somebody else who really pulverizes it and just uh, lays it out in a kind of a rectangular um, cookie sheet and then freezes it in their cookie sheet. But uh, this is convenient for us. So you pack your um, ginger in your ice tray. And I like to add just a little bit of water just to kind of hold it together when it freezes, but you could freeze it without, without um, uh, adding water. And then take that and put it in your freezer. And when it comes out of the freezer, basically you get, you get ginger ice cubes. And then you can take these ginger ice cubes and if you're cooking something, you're making a stir fry and you're adding ginger to it, or you're making a stew or whatever you're making that you want to put ginger in, just drop that in there and you've got your ginger. And this will last for forever in the freezer. Okay. What we love to do with it in the way that we eat ginger on a daily basis is by making tea. And you're going to find there are many people who have different ways of making tea with ginger. And I'm going to show you how we do it. So uh, choose the way, choose the method that you like best. But basically, we just put it in a teapot. So um, in this case, we could either, we could just take a couple of these and drop them in. What we normally do is we just get a grater and we take, a, we take how much ever ginger we want to put in our tea and we just grate it, okay? So ginger grates really easily. So you can either use, if you've frozen it and you've got your frozen ice cubes, you can use those. If you have uh, fresh ginger, you can just grate your ginger 
with a, with a grater, with a simple grater. Okay, and then depending on how strong you want your tea, put your grated ginger in your in your teapot. We add a tea bag, or you can add tea leaves. But there are other people who just make the tea just with the ginger and maybe add a little bit of honey and a little bit of lemon and they drink it that way is, and that's perfectly fine as well. So it's all to your own taste. But then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to turn on my teapot and just let that brew. I have one bag of Earl Grey hanging in that teapot so that will make the tea and it'll steep for a while and then we'll have a a little sip of tea uh, after it gets finished brewing. So let's let that start brewing. Let me put this back in my freezer. And let's talk about my other favorite way of consuming ginger on a daily basis. And that's in a smoothie. So smoothies, um, I don't know how many of y'all are smoothie drinkers. I love smoothies in the morning or even as an afternoon snack. It's a great way to get your fruits and vegetables for the day. It's delicious. Um, and it doesn't have to have a lot of sugar in it. It doesn't have to have, matter of fact, this one doesn't have any sugar in it. So let me show you how easy it is to make a smoothie with ginger. So, so what I have here is I have, um, I bought just frozen mango and pineapple pieces and combined them with some banana. And then I froze them in packages. And I just take out one of these packages. And it's just, again, pineapple mango, the tropical flavors, which I think really, really go with the ginger flavor, and banana, okay? So I've got that mix in there. And then I take as much ever ginger as I want to put in there. In this case, um, I'll just put, this is about one pound of ginger, and just cut it up a little bit. Drop that in there. And you, if you like dairy and dairy flavor, you could put yogurt in this or you could put milk in this. I'm just going to put a little bit of apple juice because I tried this and I think this combination is great. And I just add how much ever I think is going to make the texture that I want. So I'm not measuring anything, right? So that's that. No sugar. And this is 100% apple juice. All right, now everybody kind of plug your ears just for a second. Okay, and it's as simple as that. I like to use frozen fruit because then it gives me a nice texture. It gives me this nice um, smoothie-like texture. And you pour that into your glass. And this is a single serving, no sugar, all fruit with about a gram of ginger in it, and it's really delicious actually. Mm. Makes you want to have some, doesn't it? So you could drink that every day and you'd be consuming a nice bit of ginger just by doing that. The other way is candied ginger. So if you have a sweet tooth and you're eating a whole bunch of just junky kind of sweet stuff that doesn't have much nutrition in it, this is a wonderful alternative. Um, I got this from the local Kroger's. Um, we've tried to make them, and so far we have not mastered the art of making the, the candy ginger, but this is just delicious. So when you're just dying for something sweet, rather than going for something that has no health benefits to you at all, try a little bit of candy ginger. Really nice flavor. Um, one of these, matter of fact, I probably wouldn't even want one of these. I mean, half of these would be enough to, to take a bite out of that sweet tooth you've got and it's delicious and really good for you. So this is another opportunity for you to consume ginger in a way that you like it on a regular basis to actually get the benefits from regular use of ginger in your diet. Let me show you one other thing. So, so this is the leftover water and sugar from cooking the ginger. So now actually I've got this really nice syrup that I can add to, let's say you have a tea, you just want to sweeten it a little bit, I can add this ginger flavored sugar syrup into my tea. 
or whatever. There are other, there's some wonderful drink, other drinks you can put this into that really gives it some nice flavor. But this is a nice thing to have around your kitchen as well if you just want to add some sweet ginger flavor to something. This is a wonderful product. Okay, so we have our, our ginger tea uh, brewing here. I think this would have to sit just for a little bit longer to really, uh, to really steep and get the flavor. But basically, once that's done, once that's done steeping, just take your little strainer. I'd probably let this sit here maybe for 15, 20 minutes before I drink it under normal conditions. But, and it'll get a little darker and it'll get a stronger ginger flavor. Just pour it into your cup. If you like to add honey or lemon, you can add honey and lemon to it. And then what you've got is just a really nice cup of ginger tea. So that's a few little tips on how to bring that ginger into your house and eat it on a daily basis for, to get its health benefits. I do want to add that adding ginger to your diet is only one part of what would make a healthy diet. So our healthy diet isn't one food item. Our healthy, a healthy diet is a whole dietary pattern, a way of eating and consuming. And this is just one little piece for that. So that's today's home cooking tip. You can get more of our great home cooking recommendations at our YouTube channel. Okay. So I hope that some, I hope that that came through for you all. Uh, you were able to hear it. If not, I think Chris is going to make it available, uh, this video available to you all so you can listen to it later. But the idea then is really how do you use this in a way that fits into your, the way you eat, your dietary pattern, so that you can be consuming it regularly to get the health benefits that we've described. And that's it for me. Thank you, Carlin. Excellent job. Very, very important information. And, and Carlin, if that, um, if that YouTube channel that, you're, uh, that contains a series of nutritional information and, and uh, including that uh, video you just did, if it's available at a certain site, if you wanted to put it in the chat for everybody, that'd be great. Uh, great, but I'll do that. Yeah, but what we're going to do, uh, Mark Klingman is, is on. He's going to, he's our technical guy. He's going to try to figure out how we can get Dr. Uh, Carlin Rafi's presentation to everybody. It, I know it was a little blurry, just a bandwidth problem. So we apologize for that. But uh, now between, uh, between Dr. Sneaky and Dr. Rafi, there were two great presentations about uh, health benefits, the mechanisms behind those benefits, and then how to incorporate it. So um, if you have any questions about that, just put it in the chat and uh, we'll try to get those answered to you for you. We're going to go ahead and move on right now, though, um, and try to stay a little bit on time. I'm going to ask Dr. Uh, Dr. Mercia, who is here at Virginia State University. He is the uh, uh, plant pathologist. He's an ag research special, uh, uh, an ag researcher, also an extension specialist. He's going to talk a little bit about ginger diseases and how to manage those. So Dr. Rafi did a good job of talking about ginger production and what we're doing here. Uh, then we've got a little bit about health benefits and how to eat the ginger. Now, um, Dr. Mersh is going to talk about uh, some of the diseases and potential issues you might have when you're producing ginger. So it's all yours, Dr. Mersh. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. And uh, you may tell me if I'm doing the right thing here. see. It looks good. Just go ahead and share the whole slideshow and we're ready to yeah. go. So can you see my screen now? Clear? Yes, it's very good. Okay. I think for the sake of also for the uh, internet, I think I'm going to go ahead and probably I may with my video somehow. But uh, anyway, my uh, name is uh, Zelale Mersha. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Rafi for inviting me, um, Chris, you, and uh, the, our communications team at VSU College of Agriculture for running this show uh, smoothly uh, so far. And uh, I am a plant pathologist by training, which simply means uh, someone taking care of uh, sick plants. 
And today I would like to talk about uh, ginger diseases, uh, particularly zooming into two aspects. One is uh, the skills that we need in diagnosis. And the other one is what I mentioned as the toolbox option for uh, management. So, Now, uh, there has been a lot of uh, interesting uh, information from Dr. Siddiqui, Dr. Srafi about the, you know, the usefulness of uh, and the miracles uh, and health benefits from ginger. No need to repeat on that, but my portion here comes, uh, does this uh, crop, that, which does a lot of miracle, can safeguard its own, its, itself? So does the ginger plant, get sick, that's um, the question that I would like to answer. The answer uh, is um, it gets sick, yes. So how we know it is, uh, if you look at this high tunnel, uh, the, the disease in general are really main concerns of many growers. Uh, since I joined uh, Virginia State University during the last three years, uh, as also mentioned by Dr. Rafi, since uh, ginger is uh, propagated vegetatively, and once you have an infected material, it can go uh, on like this, uh, like you know, uh, with a disease situation for many years. So that's a great concern. And when I looked at this high tunnel, of course, uh, the first impression I have is uh, it's most likely that soil borne diseases are anticipated in this high tunnel. And how? To anticipate that is by looking at the spatial pattern. We have some clustered or what we call aggregated patterns uh, where pockets of areas where we are either missing ginger plants or in some places um, we see some thinned out ginger plants here. So in some of the rows, for instance, we can uh, see about 60 to 70 percent of the, the ginger plants are lost to uh, soil borne diseases. In some, it might be less. So this is really a typical indicator also for many other diseases. Uh, spatial patterns are good indicators. Now, it's not only the soil born, of course, this is also one of the pictures which I took from um, Dr. Rafi's uh, raised bed uh, ginger plantation. Soil born uh, foliar diseases are also um, one big issue, uh, but it also depends how the, the extent of damage caused by fol foliar versus soil borne disease is different. Now, I'm going to um, continue listing some of uh, the diseases, the common diseases that growers are facing around the world. And uh, this is actually a very, uh, the, the first I would call it the nightmare for ginger growers. Uh, it's a bacterial wilt disease. Uh, this is a picture uh, taken from uh, University of Hawaii. And this is how it looks like. If you look, if you slice it and you can see this uh, patterned, uh, somehow uh, creamy uh, uh, appearance around the vascular tissues, what we call the xylem and phloem. And some of the bacteria even have started zooming out, or oozing out. This is really a typical indicator for a bacterial disease on, on ginger. And one uh, simple uh, uh, diagnostic, uh, field diagnostic that growers can do is, uh, using a, a technique that they can just bring a bottle of water and just uh, a, a cut a slice of the ginger and keep it upside down. And as you can see from the picture here, you may be able to see the bacteria oozing out of the slice of the ginger. So that's a, a typical field diagnosis. And this is a slide which I took uh, from uh, farmer Bill Cox, uh, Casal Monte Farm in Powhatan, Virginia. Uh, I highly encourage every grower. Um, um, I, I, I listen to him for the last three years and every time he mentions about the severity of disease problems on his plus, uh, basically by bacterial wilt. Uh, uh, that's really very helpful. And uh, all the nitty gritty on uh, ginger production also can be found from the YouTube that I have uh, given a link here. So this is uh, his uh, production uh, and few days later, as you can see here, there is a total catastrophe uh, by what was later diagnosed to be a bacterial wilt problem. Uh, so uh, what, why I said a nightmare is probably within, you know, if you are away for two, three days, 
you may end up getting such a situation. Uh, so early detection is a lifesaver, I would say. And that's the reason also that I'm uh, focusing here in uh, uh, diagnostic skills. So uh, if you try to do the, for example, the slicing and uh, the oozing technique very easily, uh, then immediately remove uh, that symptomatic plant, you would have really saved quite a lot uh, from destruction. So the second group are uh, what I call them water molds, uh, mainly caused by PTM and uh, his cousins. So PTM belongs to one of the groups called water mold and uh, definitely uh, is highly favored by uh, stagnant water and a lot of excess water. So moisture management is really very critical uh, to, to avoid soft throats. So this is how the symptom uh, looks like, mushy and watery appearance of the rhizome is it, uh, and the crown area is typical uh, symptom. And uh, these are also, uh, you know, uh, the, the damage they cause is really very fast. As you can see, for one, they have uh, various forms of weaponry. Uh, they have different forms of spores that are coming to the ginger plant. One of them are the oo spores and they have the zoospores, and uh, once they infected, they can kill the plant in a very short span of time. So that's also why I really categorize them uh, as a second. So the third groups which we are uh, uh, encountering most frequently on, over the last three years at least are yellows caused by fungi, a typical symptoms of the slice, as you can see here. Uh, discoloration also on the uh, vascular tissue. And there could be more actually, this is just my third year into the uh, ginger pathology. So uh, phyllotita, phyllosticta gingivaris leaf spot, we anticipate it. Probably we will also have more of the pathogens on leaf spots. So and still, this is really an ongoing uh, experiment. I haven't yet seen uh, sclerotium, uh, but if it happens also, this is uh, one, one very destructive disease. So the last group also, which uh, uh, I am very positive that we have them here in Virginia uh, are nematodes, uh, primarily root node nematodes. I will show you some pictures in the coming slides. So this has been reported uh, from Georgia in 2019. And currently uh, I'm working uh, closely with uh, one of the world-class nematologists, uh, just, um, Professor Eisenbach from Virginia Tech. And he has given me a preliminary identification that uh, we may have a Melorigan incognita here in our uh, ginger production system. So talking of ginger, this is actually a surprise. I was discussing this with Dr. Rafi. This is a potted ginger plant. I was doing it uh, for some other inoculation purpose. We have a brand new potting mix, nothing. So we don't know where it's coming from, but after about four or five months uh, when we uh, washed them out, I typically saw also the noted like the root node symptoms that you can uh, clearly see here. And when uh, I dissected them and put them on a microscope, uh, I was able to see also, uh, this is also identified by Dr. Eisenbach. This is the female stage with a lot of eggs inside. And this is the actively feeding stage, which you can uh, if you have uh, microscope capability and you're uh, at home, uh, you may be able to see the needle-like sty stylets at the tip, uh, which are really indicating of uh, a parasitic nematode uh, versus the many uh, uh, hundreds of species that we have, which are really beneficial. So uh, again, uh, it's about nematodes on the left side. These are uh, some uh, pictures, the Fizarium yellow from one of my trials, which is also uh, still ongoing uh, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Rafi in the high tunnel. And the leaf spots are there. And uh, on the other side, of course, this year is really uh, very unique in many ways. We weren't able to be on top of everything, but uh, insects, every sort of caterpillars may find and grasshoppers uh, and bugs are also a part of the problem on ginger. So uh, this, Crop basically is really prone to a lot of uh, biotic uh, problems. And these are some of the lists, which are a summary of the list that I already uh, mentioned. Uh, and of course, uh, one has to bear in mind that uh, uh, pathogens and bugs, they don't really 
choose and select. So they come all at the same time to affect the same crop, uh, you know, uh, at a time. Now, this is a very important slide, of course. Uh, diagnostics is not really what most of growers should really worry a lot about. Uh, of course, it's critical, especially for some uh, diseases like the bacterial wilt, because you really have to be on top of it. Or for the uh, soft rots that I mentioned, uh, you, sh you should be on top of it within the first few days. If not, it might be too late. But for the others I mentioned, for example, for uh, the yellows and for nematodes, you may have some, uh, you know, uh, time at least to deal with diagnosis. And your uh, first go-to would be your uh, county extension, uh, wherever you are located at. And then, of course, uh, to, uh, you can send samples to the plant diagnostic clinic in Blacksburg. Uh, this is uh, the information, a very useful information. If you needed uh, that, also I, you can also contact me later on. Uh, if you have a networking with uh, um, BDAX, there are some plant pathologists there too that uh, would be able to help you uh, directly or at least guide you to which other uh, networks that you have to move to. And this is um, a very popular uh, diagnostic service. Uh, an industry, Indiana-based industry. Uh, I have a uh, time-to-time conversation with them. So uh, if you are having a commercial farm, uh, particularly, and if you need uh, serologic and molecular detections too, they are really very good uh, responsive um, if, uh, for inquiries. So you can contact them and they can do a higher level diagnostics uh, on your uh, ginger. Now, uh, I would move on to what I mentioned, uh, the toolbox, or what uh, I also call them the little hammers approach, because there is no silver bullet that really works for every problem at a time anyway. Uh, this has already been mentioned time and again. Uh, it's all, it all starts from the seed rhizomes. I can't really mention enough, uh, starting with uh, pathogen-free and healthy uh, rhizome. Uh, uh, so we won't really uh, like to start the one I, I show like on the right side here. It's a typical no-no. Otherwise, you may be really ending up just uh, having a waste of resource in everything. Now, uh, the second, uh, which is really also mentioned by uh, Dr. Rafi and the uh, horticulturists and the agronomy part, these are all, you know, um, interconnected anyway. I, I, I like to call them, some people call them cultural uh, methods. I like to them, call them best management practices. So you got to choose the right site and the right variety um, and the planting time. Uh, by planting time, I meant uh, when to start in the greenhouse and hoop houses or when transplanting. Uh, like this year, we're really very late in transplanting because of COVID and uh, having a really a shortage of uh, personnel, but that also has affected to some extent our research that's going on at Randall Farm. At drainage, I would also come back to it and mention it, uh, drainage and moisture management, particularly talking of uh, uh, soil borne diseases, uh, uh, I can't really also stress enough on that. Um, so uh, again, uh, I would like to just mention a few uh, common uh, tactics and strategies that would be helpful to manage uh, yellows, wilts, and rots, uh, basically dry and wet rots. Uh, so the preventive methods, uh, uh, one of them, of course, again, um, it goes back to uh, starting with a healthy uh, pathogen-free rhizome for planting. And for this option, you have, um, there are fungicides uh, that you can use, and also biofungicides. So, for organic producers. Um, and uh, I'm very familiar with trichoderma based um, for a number of pathosystems on vegetables and other crops too. So I'm really very positive. And uh, uh, there are research uh, mainly done in the Asian hemisphere, in Hawaii, uh, in Australia, in New Zealand. Uh, people have used the different forms of it uh, before starting even to drench. Uh, or to dip or to spray. So here in the US, uh, I usually get my trichoderma-based uh, products. Uh, this is just an example. I'm not really promoting any company or product here, but you can uh, go there and choose and select, of course. Uh, Bioworks Inc. is one of uh, the providers. And Griffin Greenhouse here in Richmond area is also 
where you can get a, you know, a connection to get these products. So hot water treatment, uh, this is a, a blanket recommendation actually for most crops, uh, you know, there are variations of it. Uh, this is 51 Celsius uh, for 10 minutes or 51 is equivalent to 124 Fahrenheit. So uh, uh, this is not my, my research, but you know, I'm still uh, lining up to do future research here uh, in Virginia uh, to test the different levels of temperature and durations uh, to effectively really know what is viable without hurting the seed rhizome. So again, uh, in India and in other countries, uh, people have uh, experimented with radiation, uh, use of nanotechnology. These are also some recent techniques uh, and also resistant inducers. Uh, this is also one of the area which uh, I'm very uh, familiar with, uh, particularly with um, some other pathosystems. And I'm hoping that we can also some uh, resistance inducers. So tissue culture, uh, there are uh, quite a few successes also. Uh, in getting uh, pathogen-free rhizomes, uh, mainly in New Zealand, Australia, and in Hawaii. So this is also another option for getting a uh, uh, pathogen-free rhizome. So uh, drainage again, I'm, I, I can't stress back again um, the soil type that you uh, do uh, your ginger production. Mounding has already been mentioned by Dr. Rafi. Uh, it also improves drainage in addition to also uh, you know, the horticultural uh, qualities that improves with ginger. Raised beds and grow bags are very excellent. And uh, uh, as you can see here, I think there is really a big uh, progress with uh, grow bags and uh, raised beds. Uh, and one of, uh, from the plant management perspective, of course, the fact that we have a gravity, whenever we raise something, there is no chance for water to stay around the uh, rhizosphere of uh, the plant so that we, we easily avoid that kind of uh, water logging situation around the root zone. Rotation is uh, it's a very challenging, it's been mentioned, but uh, you know, for most soil-borne pathogens like fusarium and others, uh, you need number of years. And uh, if, unless you have really quite ample of a luxury of a space, and production area, I would I would say this to be really a very limiting uh, factor in many cases, and uh, which makes really rotation a difficult practice. So drenching, as I mentioned, with fungicides, uh, solarization is uh, one practice. Also, this is also I think from India or Nepal uh, experience. What they did is they exposed their soil for a no for extended number of days, started from zero to sixty days. And the more they expose their soils to the sunlight, the radiation, you can uh, see the number of uh, uh, colony forming units of PTM. It really reduces. And if you keep it solarized to about 60 days, uh, literally it's killed every soil pathogen inside that soil. So biological control and uh, basically the last one is again back to the toolbox option. So what really works best for each farm? So these are some of my student uh, experiments in the lab. And uh, this is a very aggressive uh, biological product, trichoderma based again. You can see within three days how, how much it has really engulfed most of the resource. And within about 10 days, uh, the pathogen is really is encircled with no chance of really growing further, so, so to say. So based on this uh, in, you know, uh, laboratory results, we went out to the field. Uh, we are on the second year. Hopefully, we can get some results from um, this year's research to compile our, 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 our outcome in general. So we treated the soil and uh, we, we spread uh, some, some of these biological products. 2020 is, again, a challenge. Uh, you can see this is last year we were able to start early, uh, June 13. This year, we are really delayed by July 13. We are really contemplating shall we or shall we not? But uh, Mr. Charles here, Dr. Ravi's co-worker and me were planting in July 13. Again, it's really a one month interval, but um, this is after we treat it and uh, when we are planting the, the crops. And this is about uh, two months later, uh, looking at some of the symptoms appearing on uh, inoculated uh, control plants. So I think this is all what I have. Uh, sorry, I may have uh, went a little bit over time. 
Uh, this is my information. Uh, you can either shoot me an email or give me a call. And I would uh, finish my presentation here. Thank you, Dr. Mersha. Excellent presentation. Uh, certainly a very, very important part of all this uh, ginger production. Um, Dr. Mersha, for the sake of time, I'm going to ask you, there are a couple questions. I'm going to ask you maybe to look at those in the chat. And if you want to try to answer them through the chat, or we can answer them live um, a little bit later towards the end of all these presentations, uh, if that's all right. Is that okay with you? Yes. Yeah, I, I'll go I'll go to the chat and I'll look at them. And if I, if I can, yeah. That's all right. And so fine. we're going to go ahead and move on. Um, Dr. Uh, Mentretti with Alabama A&M University is going to talk now. Um, talking about growing and marketing, growing and marketing turmeric and how it might be a crop for small farmers. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Mentretti. Can you give me a right to share the screen? We can hear you. We can hear you fine. Yeah. No, I'm trying to uh, share the screen uh, to present. I'll uh, share the presentation. Yeah. It says a uh, host disabled participant screen. Yes. Uh, Mark. Mark, uh, let me see. Hold on. I'm going to see if I can. Um, Mark, if you're on, can you make Dr. Mentretti a co-host, please? Oh, OK. Yeah, I did it once, but maybe he, he had to come back on. Let me see. Then you click on that little arrow there near uh, share screen, that small arrow next to the. There you OK, go. OK, you should have it now. OK. Got it. I'd like to thank uh, uh, the organizers for inviting me to make a presentation at this uh, workshop. Um, actually, uh, uh, we were asked to uh, participate in this last year, but uh, because of COVID or something that's been postponed. Um, I'm, so thank, thanks to everyone. And um, I'm a researcher, I'm an agronomist, so I'm not an extension guy. So my language may be a little scientific or my presentation may be more research-based. I uh, followed some of the presentations before, uh, now before me and uh, they all are more uh, extension type. But I'll try my best to uh, put some information like the extension folks do. <laughs> Uh, we have been growing turmeric for a long time, you know, uh, just for research purposes. It started off sometime in 2008, and uh, we just uh, grew them just for observation on site of the uh, main experiments, single rows. And uh, sometime in 2015, we, 2014, actually, we wrote a you know, proposal uh, because we found that it has some potential for growing in the south. So I have a grad student here, Lam Dong, he's from Vietnam. Uh, he brought a lot of Vietnamese varieties. And our um, we got, I think, we are in the third um, uh, project funded uh, recently. So we'll be talking mostly about growing and marketing turmeric uh, here in Alabama. Okay. We all know this, uh, it's a rhizomatous uh, perennial herb, belongs to Zingiberaceae family. Uh, it's, uh, we believe it is originated in India, Indian subcontinent. And um, India is the major producer by, by large. They, uh, some key states there that produce 375,000 metric tons and uh, export nearly 80% of that out. So this is um, a diagram showing India occupies about 71% 71, 71 of the world uh, global production, uh, world production, and uh, there are a few other countries uh, that are very small segments uh, in that. So if you look at this chart, if you look at this, this uh, magenta color, pink color uh, line is actually the world uh, total production of that India is somewhere right down there. Other countries are here. U.S. imports about 90% of its requirements and uh, most of it comes from India. I think about 70-80% um, of uh, what we have here in the U.S. 
uh, is from India. Okay. So the global market volume is about 1.7 met million metric tons. And um, the overall market for turmeric is expected to increase to 1.7 million metric tons by 2027. As a natural food, um, health and food uh, supplement here in the US, it, it grosses around $46 million a year. Uh, this is uh, 2015, but it's been growing probably at about 8% rate annually. Uh, U.S. imports about 36 million tons. Okay, uh, we try. I try. I, I spoke to some of the um, main key players who import uh, turmeric from uh, India. Uh, they are not interested in any uh, domestically produced uh, turmeric, mainly because of the cost factor. They say. Uh, they get um, uh, turmeric very cheap from India, so they are not really uh, thinking of uh, buying locally. But still, there is a big local market. That's what uh, it's open for uh, the local growers. So there are a lot of uses. Turmeric, uh, the uses are going on. Uh, turmeric is probably, you know, it's been used for more than 2,000 years. And... Um, the use mainly started as a dye. They used to dye their uh, saffron ochre clothes, the Buddhist monks, uh, and then they discovered the food uses and now a lot of medicinal uses, okay? Uh, these are some of the medicinal uses, uh, some of the uses, turmeric, uh, most parts of the turmeric uh, rhizomes are used in one way or the other in a wide range of products. Okay, so medicine, medicinal or herbal supplements is leading now uh, in the US. Uh, next they say would be the cosmetics. Right now, most of the consumption here in the US is as a um, herbal supplement uh, because it has a lot of medicinal uh, properties, mainly anti-inflammatory uh, anti property. Okay, this uh, figure here shows uh, how um, how, uh, how many uh, diseases, ailments, turmeric can, is uh, used for curing. Uh, almost all parts of the body, uh, any type of ailment, uh, they have used turmeric as a form of uh, uh, treatment. Okay. So this grows in a wide range of um, environments from sea levels up to about 1200 uh, meters uh, above sea level. Um, it likes uh, nice hot, humid um, temperatures. So generally in coastal areas of uh, India, they, they are the main uh, producing um, sites in India. Um, and it is an easily propagated crop. You know, all you have to do is um, just uh, plant the uh, rhizomes uh, in the soil and give some organic manure and it does pretty good comes out very easily. Here I can see volume of uh, uh, thermic production. And this is short is from India. These slides here show how it is planted. This is a pre uh, sprouted uh, rhizome that's being planted in the soil. Okay. So here in the US, uh, there is a lot of interest in growing thermic. A lot of farmers have shown interest in uh, meeting the demand for turmeric either fresh or uh, herbal, uh, dry herbal products markets. Uh, but the thing is we don't have a proper variety. The variety that mostly used here in the US uh, comes from Hawaii. And um, a, lot, a lot of times this particular variety may not be uh, adapted to the regions that we grow here in the um, South or mid uh, US. So we started uh, our project way back in 2015 uh, to determine the variation between and within species of uh, fresh and dry rhizome yield. And I also looked at the curcumina. There are three major curcumina. Actually, there are four, but the fourth one is very uh, minor and negligible. But the main ones are these three, this desmethoxy, desmethoxy, and uh, curcumin. All three combined together is what we call the total curcumin. And that is the uh, 
bioactive compound that is uh, attributed with all kinds of uh, medicinal properties. So our research, we took about 14 different varieties and then we um, planted them at several locations and um, looked at their uh, growth, development and yield and also the curcumin content. And uh, in 2019, we selected five varieties and we gave them to about 18 farmers across Alabama and um, looked at on-farm production as well. Okay. So in this project, we, the main uh, players were you know, our university, Alabama a and the lead university here in the North Alabama. Then the middle of Alabama, we had Auburn University Research Station and down here towards uh, Mobile, we had uh, Headland Research Station. So we kind of had uh, three different locations across Alabama and we planted these 14 different varieties. So uh, all of it is uh, organic um, production is some screenshot, some shots of the uh, crop at Alabama a and University. Okay. Some of it produces beautiful flowers yeah, it's got some some um, turmeric varieties are ornamental. They produce a head with a beautiful flower on the top, whereas a regular turmeric uh, that we grow for the rhizomes uh, actually has the flowers somewhere in the somewhere here in the canopy. So we actually had 14 out of that, nine, uh, uh, nine were uh, um, curcuma longa, three were curcuma zedoria, and uh, two were curcuma uh, amada and C and curcuma aeruginosa. Okay, the way we uh, grow them is we first raise these seedlings in the, um, not the seedlings, but we sprout these uh, rhizomes in the greenhouse, um, and then we transplant them onto the uh, field and it's all organic. So we put um, uh, either pelleted poultry litter to give about 50, 60, 80 pounds of uh, per acre of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And uh, use uh, black plastic um, mulch uh, with a drip tape underneath. And every three weeks, we feed the crop with uh, fish emulsion. Okay. So actually, first we rotate the land. We raise. We we make. Uh, we add uh, the a mix of um, organic manures. Uh, just just since the last two three years, we've been actually adding cow manure, poultry manure, and vermicompost. All three to provide about seventy five pounds of <coughs> nitrogen per acre. So make the beds, put the plastic with the tape, and then transplant. Uh, this uh, plant sometime in mid June or uh, we always aim for uh, mid May, but it never works. It always goes into mid June, and uh, we harvest soon after the frost, yeah, sometime in uh, December. Yeah, and uh, also when once we harvest the rhizomes, um, we dry them. Uh, we take a subsample, uh, dry that at uh, 50 degrees Celsius, first day dryer. Um, make a powder and then uh, determine the curcuminoids using the HPLC system. And we also look at some uh, <clears throat> elements, uh, particularly metals uh, in this uh, by using the uh, ICP, uh, inductively coupled plasma spectrometry. Okay. So I'm just giving a snapshot of uh, one year's results. Uh, we, we have a uh, results coming, uh, yield uh, data from several years now. Um, just to give you an idea, we fresh yield uh, ranges anywhere from less than 10 uh, tons per hectare to about uh, 26, 28. Sometimes we, some years we got even 35, 38 uh, metric tons per hectare. Has a lot of water in it, it's about 90% of the rhizome is moisture water. So if you look at this dry waste, they're very low, somewhere about 2,000 kilograms. So maximum we get is about 4,000 kilograms. Okay. 
So there is a lot of variation in their um, curcumin content. Um, some of the where there is there seems to be a negative correlation between the yield and the um, curcumin levels. Uh, generally, high yielding varieties tend to have uh, less amount of curcumin in them. So some of these varieties they had pretty good levels. I'll come to this. Um, what is an desirable curcumin level from the industry point of view? So ranges anywhere from about uh, one less than one milligram per gram to about uh, five uh, around here. Well, this translates to about two two uh, two two point five uh, percent um, curcumin. Curcumin is the major component. Dust based methoxy are very low quantities, whereas curcumin is in uh, uh, like uh, 10 to anywhere from 20, up to 20, 30 uh, milligrams. Okay. Um, this is, um, we, have, we looked at the elemental content and um, does have some aluminum uh, and also some iron in this uh, rhizomes. Uh, some of this is Zadoria is a Chinese uh, Vietnamese variety and had uh, high levels of aluminum and uh, um, iron. Uh, we selected CL9 uh, for most of our research now. We are focusing on this particular variety and hopefully we'll be releasing that as a commercial variety uh, very soon. Okay. Same thing with the different chemical, uh, different elements, potassium, magnesium, phosphorus, and calcium. If you look here, there's a high content of potassium uh, in this compared to calcium or magnesium. This is calcium here, and this is magnesium. Okay. So there was a lot of uh, genotypic variation for the fresh as well as the dry eels. Uh, they generally range, dry yields generally range anywhere from 1.1 to 4 metric tons. Um, among these couple of varieties did pretty good, but overall when we looked at the combination of um, curcumin content and the um, yield, uh, we thought uh, CA1 and CL9 uh, seemed to be doing pretty good. So this is um, the curcumin levels uh, in these different varieties. So if you see here, BDMC is a 0.2 milligrams. Uh, it's less than 1% overall. Okay. Again, DMC also very low, but when it comes to uh, curcumin, uh, they are pretty high levels. Okay. We can skip this because these are the same from the graph. So we, we planted about five varieties and about 18 farms across Alabama in 2019. Uh, we, because of the COVID, we, are, uh, we could not do the uh, an, uh, chemical analysis. Our labs were all closed, but now we are uh, trying to get back and uh, do some analysis. So uh, we did some surveys here. There is really not a very openly available data on the market uh, for turmeric. Um, but we did a survey, one of my grad students went around and uh, uh, also did some phone calls and got some of the information. If you look here, price um, range pretty good. Um, we, uh, it is, uh, there's not much of a difference between organic and uh, uh, conventionally grown turmeric. If you look at the price point of view. Um, Prices range depending upon the uh, company, you know, uh, anywhere from four five dollars to about thirty one dollars, very big range. Uh, some of the farmers they just um, sell on direct contact. Uh, they sell up to about twenty two dollars. But the uh, if you look at the most common price here, it would be somewhere around eight to fifteen dollars a pound on a fresh weight basis. So there is a lot of retail and also online um, selling of this uh, turmeric. 
So, and um, there are uh, quantities, you know, I have not seen anybody growing large area, acreage of turmeric here. Uh, one farmer tried to grow about 10 acres last year, uh, but then um, he just couldn't find a market. They were, uh, the, nobody picked it. And um, yeah, he has now uh, stopped growing even turmeric because that's how much loss he suffered. So this is, uh, this tends to be a, still a small uh, farm crop. It's like a niche crop and uh, mostly sold in local grocery stores, fresh uh, farmers markets, and also directly to the uh, consumers. Same thing here, we, a lot of um, uh, stores that sell this turmeric and uh, we were mainly interested in what kind of gross sales and uh, also how many uh, dollars per pound. So it didn't exceed more than I think uh, up to five, $600. Yeah, if you see here, there is the uh, highest was about $400 uh, gross sale from this company, Pinner Creek Organics. Okay, so um, the, the herbal company wants uh, turmeric uh, with about uh, 3.5 or above, uh, 3.5 percent or above uh, curcumin levels. Uh, that is what uh, their benchmark is. If you talk to Gaia herbs or the Mountain Rose herbs, uh, these companies uh, they look for uh, turmeric that can be used in uh, medicinal uh, products uh, with about 3.5 or above. But here in all these um, 10 years of uh, production in our place uh, in Alabama. Uh, we have not exceeded uh, more than three. Uh, the best we got was like 3.4% uh, one year. Uh, most of the time it's somewhere around two to 2.8%. Uh, so looking at what could be the reason. Um, I come from India and I talked to some people in India. They, uh, they generally grow the crop anywhere from nine to 12 months, okay? Uh, that's supposed to give them high levels of curcumin and also good yields. But then they have the uh, weather, they have the uh, temperatures and the uh, conditions for uh, growing a crop for 10 months without any issues. But in our case, uh, the best we can get because of the late uh, frosts in April and again early frosts in November, uh, our growing season, particularly in the North Alabama, is about seven months. These are the months here. And um, whereas we think about uh, a good growing season would be nine to 12 months, nine to 10 months uh, for getting good levels of uh, uh, curcumin. So what we did is uh, we, we went back here and uh, we went to, one of my grad student uh, went back to Vietnam for a summer and he brought about 60 varieties of uh, turmeric. Um, if you look here, they, they are all different color, blue, green, yellow, uh, purple, even black. Now this year he got one black one. If you cut it, it is all black turmeric. Um, they do not have any, so these colored ones don't have any curcumin. But um, in South Asian countries, they're highly priced for their medicinal uses. So there are certain compounds in these colored uh, rhizomes uh, that um, are used for certain medicinal purposes. Uh, whereas uh, this, the ones rich in curcumin color is attractive, yellow, orange, and uh, they're mostly used uh, for uh, in food, uh, making curries and, uh, uh, and um, uh, smoothies and so on. Uh, so these, uh, the ones that we brought from Vietnam, some of them had nearly 6.8% uh, curcumin content. Uh, they, we selected about these uh, 20, I think about uh, 15 or 18 varieties out of the 60 uh, that had more than 4% curcumin levels. 
the total curve, this uh, orange bars here. Okay, so we think we have, this is um, actually, um, we compared the ones from grown in Vietnam and the ones grown here in Alabama. Uh, these levels were very consistent uh, in these varieties. So we are now, we got a new project funded. We are looking at high tunnel production, um, heat pads, and uh, hot water treatment uh, to enable early spotting and um, so that uh, it gives the early season advantage and can be grown out in the open field or they can simply grow in high tunnels. So the one new technology we're looking at is called low temperature plasma. Uh, plasma is um, like helium or argon gas, uh, which is broken up with electricity. This is the source here. We run the um, uh, electrode through the middle here and then put the gas and then uh, once the uh, electricity is passed through the gas, then it breaks up the, uh, the gas into its uh, atoms or electrons. And these come out uh, here as a um, plasma. This is called the plasma. So we created this uh, kind of, a, we were using 3D printing. We had this uh, kind of a contraption here where it comes like a brush, because this jet here is about five, six millimeters, not much. And uh, width is only two, three millimeters. So we put uh, here through this and treat the um, rhizomes. So we are trying to do some seasonal extension here by making them to sprout early. So when we did that, they all sprouted very early. If you look at this here, you know, uh, the control that was not treated did not germinate at all. These are six month old, very immature rhizomes. And um, even those, when we treated at 60, 90 and 120 seconds, uh, they sprouted. And then we planted in the, this is in the greenhouse, their plant heights were much higher compared to the control. For example, in the seven month old, which is a mature rhizome, uh, the control took 49 days, whereas the treated 21 days. Uh, and then the, if you look at the height, plant height, this is the control here way down. And they all treated once are way up. This is how it looks in the field. We planted those in the field. And uh, the great thing about this is the effects are consistent. They're in the greenhouse. This is in the greenhouse. If you can see 90 second treated plants taller uh, again, in this one also, same trend we saw in the field, because I think the early season effect is carrying through. And eels, when we harvested them, we harvested actually in January, and um, uh, compared, there was no control here, but um, in this seven month old, compared to the control, the eels were almost double. So we feel that there is, Something over here. Okay. Now, do we have any time or I'm almost done? Uh, you're fine. Go ahead. I just, you, you, I think you've got an obligation in a little while, so I just didn't want to keep you. <laughs> okay. I just uh, wanted to touch on this, you know, um, production here uh, in Alabama, what most of the farmers are doing. Uh, they just, um, uh, most of, most of the production here is, um, uh, using organic uh, production systems and uh, typically raised beds. Uh, a lot of them use plastic. It seems to be doing pretty good. What the terminate doesn't like, like ginger or any other crop is, doesn't like standing water, water lock conditions. It has to be a dry, uh, good friable, well-drained soil. And um, also the temperature has to be above 55, 60 degrees um, Fahrenheit or the soil temperatures before you can plant, otherwise the rhizomes will just sit there. Now, uh, we, you, we have tried both uh, sprouted rhizomes and unsprouted rhizomes, we didn't see any difference. Uh, within two months, they catch on pretty good and I, we couldn't find any difference between the sprouted or the unsprouted. So uh, if you're doing, uh, if you're growing in high tunnels, that is what a lot of farmers uh, prefer uh, for growing this crop. 
is uh, you can use rhizomes directly. Good quality, good, good um, uh, fresh rhizomes um, can be planted. Your farmers, they uh, keep aside 25% of their harvest on the previous year in the cool, dry conditions and then they plan the following season, they all come out pretty good. And uh, give it a good dose of organic manure, uh, anywhere from 20 to 30 tons per acre, uh, works pretty good for this. Uh, one, uh, some cases we have seen uh, one basal application about 20 or 30 tons of uh, organic manure, you don't have to add any more. Crop does pretty good, they get uh, pretty good yields. As this is still a new crop, so we are not seeing much insect pests or disease, but uh, we did see some um, uh, uh, disease last year where uh, the, the, this um, uh, leaf spot disease uh, came up. And uh, in, in one instance, uh, too much of water at the time of planting uh, resulted in Pythium or Rhizoctonia uh, disease on those uh, uh, small plants. Uh, other than that, um, you don't see any, we, we have not seen any uh, disease or insect uh, problems to put anything. Um, so uh, that is uh, what it is, still a new crop, not a big acreage. Uh, therefore, uh, it's not the disease and the insects have not discovered this crop. So with this, I end my presentation I have to thank uh, everyone one more time. And uh, any questions, like I think yeah, uh, we'll be doing it at the end of the session. So I'll try to come back uh, around. Uh, what time would that be? Well, we're North probably going, we're running a little behind. So we'll probably be around 1230. But there, I see one question real quick and then we'll let you go. Do you know of any other alternatives to the plasma for early sprouting? Or have you had any experience with any other types of uh, getting earliness in that sprouting? Uh, pardon? Can you repeat the question, Chris? Yeah, are there any alternatives to the plasma for early sprouting that other than- Yeah, early sprouting, we are actually comparing that with uh, heat pad. Heat pad also does very good. Uh, we did uh, several studies with heat pad um, where um, it, they do sprout early. Uh, but the um, thing with uh, plasma is that it also kills um, uh, pathogens. Okay. Uh, that's a, so you're getting uh, two um, benefits here. One is early sprouting and uh, also uh, killing any uh, organisms on the uh, thing. This is a new technology. We are still trying to find out uh, why and how it kills the pathogens, but there's a lot of literature out there uh, where it is uh, being used in particularly in food science uh, treating poultry and meat and packaging uh, for killing salmonella, E. coli, and all that. In this case, there we in our studies, um, we we found that uh, uh, it um, uh, prevented uh, uh, stem file and botryosum and spinach from going into conidial stage. Uh, the control uh, spore sporulated pretty good, whereas the treated there was no spore production. So it is uh, inhibiting uh, the reproduction of uh, the fungus. So this, um, and also it kills, uh, we, we, we looked at um, xanthomonas um, on uh, uh, peppers, pepper seed, and um, somehow the, there was no disease, you know, whereas the uh, untreated, uh, the seedlings had some disease on those. So, it is doing something there. We're still trying to find out uh, the mode of action, but it uh, certainly has big application in uh, uh, food safety uh, area. Very good, very good. Well, thank you, Dr. Manchetti. We appreciate uh, your presentation and the work you're doing in Alabama. And uh, maybe if, uh, if you can't make it back, um, if we have any questions, we'll send them your way. Uh, yeah. Contact information. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Huh? All right. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. All right. So we're going to go ahead and continue here. Um, I might. 
uh, yield a little bit of my time. I'm next. We've got two more presentations and we're running a little behind. I hope everybody can stay with us. But again, if you can't, uh, this will be on our YouTube channel pretty soon. Uh, I'm gonna look just for a minute here at the chat. Um, well, actually I probably won't. I think what I'm gonna do is go ahead and I'm gonna go ahead and do um, and talk a little bit uh, briefly because uh, I, I want to get to our, our last presenter um, about some of the experience we've had with hydroponic production um, of ginger uh, a little bit last year and just a little bit this year um, as we see uh, potential for, for growers thinking about this. You know, Dr. Rafi talked about and, and others have definitely talked about um, production in Virginia with uh, in a high tunnel structure. So a high tunnel structure, what we're thinking about there is mostly an unheated greenhouse structure, basically. Um, something just to help extend the growing season. So, um, so if we can grow though in a climate controlled greenhouse uh, that you might be familiar with, with active heating and cooling systems, we might be able to gain better conditions uh, for ginger production, maybe turmeric production also. We might possibly able to be able to have longer production than in the high tunnels and potentially higher yields uh, and possibly better better quality uh, because we're also in a greenhouse we're usually excluding insects and and so we might have less pest pressure potentially so and when we think about greenhouses we think about hydroponic production that's going to be production in maybe a nutrient solution only or in some type of artificial media so uh, Dr. Rafi had had some experience doing this uh, in Florida. And so he came to me and said, can we, can we try some of this? So last year, um, we did a little bit with ginger and turmeric production, just an observational study, just to see what things looked like if we had different types of media and how those different types of media might affect uh, the growth uh, inside the greenhouse and how, how it might affect their yield. Uh, and we had two production systems that we were just kind of, we cobbled together from parts and pieces that a small farmer would have. Um, and, and really to see if this would complement field or, or high tunnel production as far as having a longer uh, window of production for your marketing, you know, having consistent product with, uh, with the ginger or turmeric is important, uh, not just having quality uh, high quality good ginger, but having a consistent production over a longer window is, is probably better for the, for the grower. So we quickly last year, we, we looked at uh, perlite, which is a common media source used uh, in hydroponics, especially for tomato production, and, and also vermiculite and rice hulls, which is an, was an inexpensive uh, media amendment that comes from the, the, uh, the byproduct of the rice industry. And we had those both all we had two of those media types in, in media bags, these five gallon grow bags. As you can see here, you can see turmeric and ginger growing. Um, we were using a very similar fertilizer regimen that you would use with uh, hydroponic tomato production. So it was a feeding with every watering approximately 150 parts per million of nitrogen. And we used utilizing 51126, a complete fertilizer, calcium nitrate, magnesium sulfate, and potassium nitrate. And uh, this is through a uh, fertilizer injector system. It's a drain to waste system, so it's not a closed loop um, system like we did with this one. We had a IBC totes or individualized bulk containers uh, that were um, cut. These were used in some of our aquaponics work. And so we decided to repurpose them uh, from that work and, and try the ginger in here. Again, this was not aquaponics ginger. It was just fed with hydro, just, just synthetic fertilizer. Uh, and this was a more of a recirculating system with perlite as a media type, um, vermiculite and rice hulls. Um, this was more or less a, um, a 
flow through system where we kept about two inches of nutrient solution in the bottom of those uh, IBC containers where the production was taking place uh, at all times. So this was kind of early before harvest, but you can kind of see possibly the different media types. You can see the, uh, uh, the one on the, the uh, right is actually perlite. Uh, in the middle is uh, vermiculite and rice hulls. And these are after they've been washed off. This was kind of an early sample. But you can kind of, and you can also see, you've already seen the pictures, but you can also see what the immature ginger uh, actually looks like. So just some observations we made last year is that the spacing was, was too tight for, especially with turmeric. You can see the, how big that plant grows uh, when it's in good conditions. Um, one of the things we need to further investigate is, is when's the best time to plant in the greenhouse. Uh, sometimes it's, uh, you have to, it has to make sense. Both of these uh, you know, are dependent on um, long days. Uh, and so it, it, it needs to make sense and there needs to be a market window when you're, uh, so we need, we need to work that out a little bit. We felt that the IBC containers, the recirculating system, the, with the two inches of nutrient solution in the bottom stayed a little too wet uh, for both the crops. Uh, and then in the bag system, it seemed that those bags weren't quite big enough. Those bags, uh, and you, it, Dr. Rafi showed you the much larger bags that he's used in the high tunnels. Uh, and, and, and really you need more, more root zone. Um, so what we decided to do, and you know, we had some plans this year and things kind of got, everybody's plans got a little changed a little bit. And, uh, but we wanted to do something else, uh, kind of a follow up on that uh, this year, um, but, but also looking at too, how we can sprout a little differently, whether we can sprout directly in a production system or we can use the same system that we used for um, the high tunnel. So if you see the picture on the, uh, the bottom uh, uh, right, that's a typical one gallon pot. It's got a seed piece in the bottom um, with a peat based or bark based media. And you can see after a few weeks of that seed piece being there, it's starting to, to sprout. You can probably see the little sprouts coming up from that ginger seed piece. So what we did is we used that. Um, we had some, uh, we had a container or two. We didn't have a lot of space in the greenhouse at, at the time that we started this. So we used, a, uh, we had a small container. It was an ebb and flood system that we wanted to use to kind of make sure that the ginger didn't stay wet like it did in the past. So uh, probably not enough room uh, in this for, for really heavy production. So we have to investigate a little deeper tray, but this is kind of a standard sub-irrigation system we had on, on site. Um, and so that the reservoir, the blue tank in the bottom holds nutrient solution. Um, it's just got a sump pump that when it's energized, it, it floods the, um, floods the, uh, the white tank uh, where the ginger will be growing. And then when uh, energy from a timer turns off the pump, it all drains back out. So quickly, uh, let me just show you this quick kind of you can kind of see what uh, what this looked like um, several a few months ago when after we had planted those those sprouts those seed pieces that are sprouted into the perlite uh, it's kind of what it looked like and then throughout the season we continued to mound that up um, it was watered every day you can see that just small simple sump pump so this is just an example of a very small scale type system that you could use but it <laughs> but it is um, scalable. So this is something that, that you could extend and, and make uh, larger. Um, this is what it's looking like now, right now. Uh, we're not quite ready to harvest yet. Uh, we've got a lot of growth. Um, these leaves, as days get shorter, they kind of naturally senesce and uh, we haven't gotten to the point where we've harvested, we've started harvesting yet. That'll probably be within the next two weeks. And so um, I think, and I think Dr. Rafi's already, already um, given me his opinion that we probably need more space in this, uh, in this grow area. And so I think that's what we're gonna continue to look at on uh, ebb and flood in a system like this. Uh, with perlite, perlite seemed to do better in the observations we made last year than the other media types. Um, 
So I kind of just wanted to report a little bit on this and give you some resources uh, if you're interested in hydroponic production of ginger or turmeric um, and, and let you know that we're going to continue uh, to do some type of work in this area, uh, especially even with just uh, sprouting in hydroponic systems faster than maybe uh, uh, some other systems. Um, you can look at some of the work that's been done uh, in, in Florida recently, uh, in Arizona, and in Hawaii uh, with some of their hydroponic uh, ginger there. So I want to thank you. That was just a quick presentation uh, to, tell, to let you know a little bit about some of the things that we're doing um, in hydroponic systems in, in, uh, at VSU. Um, all right. I think I'm going to ask, uh, let's see, I'm going to go through here now. And we're going to ask uh, Miss Ann Codrington with uh, the Sani Farm in Charlotte Courthouse, Virginia, um, a little west of where we are now. And I'm going to ask you to go ahead and you're our last presentation, but our, uh, but certainly one of our, our best presentations here at the end, rounding out everything we've talked about. And you are a real farmer. Um, and so we're real interested in to hear the things that you have to say. Um, about the producing and selling ginger and, and turmeric seedlings. All right, Ann, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Chris. Is the presentation showing? It looks good. All right. Great. Well, uh, as as you know, I am actually a farmer. I'm not a doctor. I'm not teaching and I'm not experimenting except for trying to learn as much as I can. Um, our farm is called Nasani Farm and we are based in Charlotte County, Virginia. And I wanted to talk to you about growing seedlings and plants. Uh, and, and it's something that I do for sale. Um, as part of the income that our farm brings in. And the reason I do it is because I was frustrated at first because I wasn't able to find good seed for turmeric and ginger anywhere close by. I had to, to have it sent from Hawaii uh, in order to be able to grow ginger and turmeric. And I wanted to find a more sustainable way of planting these plants because I really do think that they are valuable for homeowners and for farmers and um, for anyone else who's interested in, in growing this for either medicinal or, or culinary purposes, both the ginger and the turmeric. I also decided to try to, to grow seedlings and plants for sale because I believed that if a, a, a homeowner or a gardener or a farmer wants to get started growing ginger and turmeric, it's much easier to start with a, a seedling rather than the rhizome. Because if you start with a rhizome, then you've got to um, sprout it. And that means that you're either using a high tunnel or a greenhouse or seedling mats with heat and lights. Um, and, and it can be very difficult to get that going if you can't master the water needs, the heat needs, and the timing. I also believe that uh, growing ginger and turmeric from seedlings means that as the grower, your time commitment is shorter. You don't have to start in February. You can start in May. And so you're, you're not um, spending all your time trying to get these seedlings started. I also think that when you start from a seedling rather than from a rhizome, your chance of success is greater. Um, you are able to not have to go through the part that I believe is the most difficult, uh, which is the beginning sprouting process. And so you are able to, to have greater success um, than if you were to start from a rhizome. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about our farm. Um, as I said, we're based in Charlotte County, Virginia in a town called Phoenix. And our farm produces not only ginger and turmeric, but we have herbs that we produce. 
we sell produce, we grow flowers, and the ginger and the turmeric for us is our um, primary crop. We focus on that, it is our, our specialty. Uh, and I produce uh, plants for both sale as well as for growing into produce that we then sell at farmer's markets and, and wholesale. I am a grower for Southern Exposure Seed Exchange so that if you ordered plants through their catalog, you would find our, our ginger and turmeric seedlings for sale in their catalog in the spring. We also sell seedlings at conventions and fairs uh, and, and at farmer's markets. And as I was mentioning, we sell plants um, wholesale to people who need them and online on our website. Our farm is certified naturally grown, which means that we follow organic practices and we do not use any kind of chemical fertilizers or sprays. The seed stock that we use is purchased from Hawaii Clean Seed. Uh, it's also known as Biker Dude and uh, they open their market uh, starting on November 1st. Uh, and they usually sell out, uh, but they sell in larger quantities. So you have to buy uh, and have it shipped from Hawaii if you're gonna use their services. I also have a lot of seed that I've carried over from the previous year. And I use that seed specifically for the produce part of our operation. I wanna make sure that any seedling that I'm selling is a seedling that is grown from what is called clean seed so that I'm not transferring any potential um, pathogens from my farm. That isn't to say that Hawaii clean seed doesn't sometimes come with a pathogen, but I think the chance is less. Um, I tend to grow my seedlings in pots and I have uh, about 500 pots that I plant every year of both ginger and turmeric. The majority tends to be turmeric. Um, and if I have more plants than I expected, then I plant those out uh, in, the, in the ground. I tend to start my seedlings in February uh, and, and March, and I plant them into pots in about May. Um, and just to give you a little information about how I go about doing that planting, and I have some pictures that I'll show you later, um, I use a pre a, a, a pre-prepared mix called ProMix Organic uh, for org organic growing. And I then, once I've got my sprouts, I plant into compost and wood chips, a mixture in pots for the most part. Um, we use drip irrigation uh, and we, as I said, plant starting in February, March, um, which then gets transplanted in May and we harvest uh, starting in October through the spring. Here are some pictures of when we first started using uh, bags. We no longer use them just because I really wanted my operation to be sustainable and I felt that throwing away bags every year was not fulfilling that particular goal. But just to give you a, a sense of how we have our bags lined up and then we run our drip irrigation tubing over those bags. The plants can get very large. These I believe were 10 to 12 gallon bags and um, they sometimes end up uh, with the plants outgrowing them. This is an example of a, a white turmeric that we grew that outgrew the bags that we used. This is uh, more like what we do these days. We grow in pots and we have them in high tunnels. Uh, the turmeric, as you can see, are the plants on with the larger leaves. The ginger have the more strap-like leaves. They tend to require the same growing conditions, so we grow them together. And, and the, the ground of the, of the high tunnel is covered in landscape fabric and we run drip tape or drip tubing along the rows. So if I'm producing seedlings for sale, I usually do three different kinds. I'll do bare root seedlings and those typically go for online mail order sales um, 
as well as fairs. And, and what I'll do with a fair is I'll have a tray sitting there and people will want to buy a particular number of seedlings and then I'll remove them, wrap them up and, and sell them as bare root. Um, I also sell seedlings in small and large pots and those usually go to farmers market sales and sometimes to fairs in the fall where um, I'm, I'm growing up a, a larger plant for sale that then ends up uh, producing in the following year. And then I also produce flats. Um, and those are really ones that uh, people can then pick up on their own or I'll deliver them depending on the number and, and the location. So here's an example of how we get our, our seed stock started. This would have been seed stock that came from Hawaii Clean Seed. And I use a tray, uh, a flat, called a 1020 because it's 10 inches by 20 inches um, long. And I put the pro mix into that flat and then I lay my seeds, either the, the seed ginger or the seed turmeric. And then I cover that and, and then I water it in and I place it on a heat mat. So here's another picture of how I arrange my seed in the trays uh, and how I get set up. Um, I have racks and racks of these uh, trays in either a cellar or a propagation room. Uh, and then when they sprout, uh, I will then put lights over them so that they grow under lights for a, a couple of months until about April and May. Here's a picture of what the seedlings for ginger look like in the flats that I grow. And when they are about this size, about four or five inches, then I start preparing for bare root sales. Here's an example of about the size that I like to use for the turmeric. Sometimes it doesn't have the leaves, but um, I think it's really important that the rhizome, I call it the mother, is still attached at the base of the plant because I think that the plant then can survive transport much easier in the male. Um, and then when it gets planted, it has that extra energy from that rhizome to continue it on into its new life in somebody's pot or in someone's ground. Here's an example of the kind of seedling for turmeric that I tend to sell. So it has a good root uh, mass there and it also has the rhizome attached. And then here's an example of the bare root ginger seedling. Uh, and then what I do in order to ship them is I'll wrap them in plastic to make sure that the moisture stays at the root and that the root ball stays intact. And then I pack them in newspaper, roll them so that then I can put them into the right size box depending on how many um, I'm, I'm shipping. Um, and they tend to, to ship fairly well if I can pack the box. So I use different size boxes depending, and I usually tape it down to make sure that it doesn't move around in the package. So, um, you know, if I only have two plants, I'll use a small priority mailbox. Uh, if I have more plants, I'll use a larger box. This is an example of the plants that come in a flat that I might sell. And then these are some plants that I sold in the fall and they tend to go to co conferences and, and fairs that happen in, in the fall. And then I'm very clear with the people who are buying them that these are plants that are meant to produce in the following year, but they'll be you know, ready to go and much more mature than a, a newly sprouted plant. And here's a picture of, our, of how we're getting together our plants for sale at a at a fair or a conference in the in the fall, you know, we'll usually take about a hundred plants with us when we go. Um, sometimes I'll give a presentation. For example, this is a presentation that I gave at the Mother Earth News Fair last year, uh, and I will take a flat with me, or several flats with me, um, and talk about how to produce ginger and turmeric and also talk about the benefits. And then after the fair, um, the people who've attended are interested in buying the plants. And so I will then sell them as bare root from the flat um, during that, during or after the presentation. And that's it.
Um, this is the information for my farm. Um, we do have a website where we have some of the produce and the plants that we sell. And, um, and there's my email if you have questions for me. And again, I think that the, the, the whole process has been very useful as far as growing seedlings because I feel that I'm providing a service really to the community because it's really difficult if you're not a farmer to buy a seedling um, for just a few plants uh, and not have to have it shipped all the way from Hawaii and then have a whole bag of seed that you uh, then have to find something to do with. So um, I hope that's helpful. And um, I don't know if there's time for questions, but I'm happy to take them if there are. Thank you, Ann. Very good. I think uh, I think that was very informational. And now, now we know a little bit. That's always been one of the sticking points with ginger and turmeric is, you know, where do you get seed pieces? Where do you get plants? And uh, and so some of those those questions. Uh, it's it's good to know that you're local and you work with uh, Southern Seed Exposure and Ira and, and all the people there. Yeah. Um, well, let's do this, everybody. We seem to have kind of a panel here. I think we've got most everybody still on the line that that gave a presentation. So. If it's all right with you all, we're not going to keep you too much longer. I'm going to go look through some of the questions and we'll uh, see if whoever feels like they want to weigh in on some of these. And some of the people that asked the questions might, might have had to drop off. Uh, and we're sorry about that. But David uh, in, from Maine asked, uh, well, he's in Maine. He wanted to know about Ginger uh, in that zone up there where he is, which is a, a five. And in Virginia, we don't see the only fives, we see like a 5B in the high high elevations and some of the mountains. But um, um, any any recommendations there um, on production? I know there's been some some good examples of, of production of ginger in high tunnels in Maine. So I mean, I think it can be done. Um, Raisa, anything you want to comment on that? Um, in a high tunnel, obviously, maybe maybe starting starting the plants or, or getting plants, uh, you know, as as um, as big as they can before they go in the ground. Trying to shorten that that growing that trying to get through that short growing season. Any comments on any of that? Yeah, I think I agree with you. High tunnels and uh, seedlings is uh, is the way to go. All right. Very good. All right. Um, Joanne, I had a question about, are there any uses for the foliage discarded after harvest? Um, I'm not sure about that. I mean, uh, what do you think? Anybody out there? Well, I can... The... Go ahead, Ann. Okay. So I can, I can talk a little bit about what we do. Um, we, we, because we're organically inclined, we tend to, to use a lot of compost. And so we do compost them, but it really does hurt to see them going into the compost. So I tend to try to use as much of the stem as I can in, in what I cook. Um, and in products that I make. So in teas and things like that, I also use them for um, mulch as well as for um, cooking. So you can, for example, take a turmeric leaf and wrap um, certain foods and then steam them as a way of getting that aroma into a lot of what you're cooking. Yeah, very good. Uh, Reza, there was a question about some of your short videos that you had in your presentation. Are they gonna be available on our website? Do you know if, are you planning on putting those up there on the YouTube uh, VSU College of Agriculture mm -hmm. website? Good. good. Yes. They were a little shaky and I, they're really good videos. So I was the one, I was hoping they would be, we'd be able to put them on there so people can see those. So you can access those as well as all these presentations. You're going to be able to access those on that, uh, on that. Mark Klingman um, is going to be able to put that on there. He's our technical guru here and he's going to help us with that. Um, there was a question about uh, what is the size of baby ginger compared to regular ginger? I think we saw a few pictures maybe of each. Uh, so who wants to comment maybe on that, the size difference or maybe comment on the differences in general as far as the, uh, uh, how potent it is, how fibrous it is, that sort of thing. Anybody wanna tackle that? 
Uh, I start and then maybe uh, other colleagues could help. Definitely they are less fibrous and less pungent as uh, as young ginger. I think uh, the notion of baby ginger is maybe confusing a little bit, but the baby ginger is actually the young ginger, immature ginger, what we call baby ginger. But, uh, but we have actually, we haven't really looked at the, at the, the weight aspects of it in terms of uh, whether if you harvest it and, and store it and make, make it go through that process of maturity, what happens to the, to the weight? This is something that we are hoping to be able to do to just generate some data, to make sure that we compare the mature and immature aspects of it. Very, very good. So Kimmy asked, uh, Kimmy's in Maryland, and she uh, has one gallon containers uh, that have been grown on the deck. Uh, is there any way to keep that going indoors in the winter months? And she does have access to grow lights. Uh, and these were just planted in August. So um, what do you think, Reza? If she can extend those that to long days and the warm temperatures, do you think she'll be all right inside? Yeah, well, I, they, they definitely could. But what happens is when they reach full and mature, uh, the, the full maturity at a certain point, senescence would happen and that whole foliage, even though we always say ginger is a, is a perennial crop, but the, the, the foliage part is annual. It, it, it dies off when the rhizome reaches full maturity and it starts all over again, yeah. To, I think she could take it inside and let it fully mature. And then when the foliage dies, you could probably uh, you know, harvest part of it and eat part of it. And then just take some of those mature rice and replant them and restart all, all over. And just start that cycle again. Very good. Um, and so that goes back to this. Another question Terry had, is it not possible to produce mature ginger that can be cured and stored? So I think you covered that a little bit, Reza, when you talked about how to keep, how to produce seed pieces for next year. So you do produce that just longer period of time in the tunnels. Yes. Yes, you just need to protect it against frost because they're very sensitive to cold temperature below 45, really slows down. And the first frost of the season that we have, the top is literally killed. And then the frost usually, unlike turmeric, the frost just starts affecting also the rhizome. So that you need to protect it and let it go slowly and it matures itself slowly over time um, to protect it. And then when it reaches by December, uh, I think by December, our experience at Randolph Farm, so by December, the rhizome reaches full maturity. On the other hand, if you protect it until December, I think you could harvest it and uh, use it as, as a mature, mature ginger and use it for seed pieces and uh, for seed, for seed piece production. Very good. And you'd already answered of the size, the 20 gallon containers are the ones you're using in your high tunnels. Somebody would asked that. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, Let's see, we had some, some people were telling that they, they peel, Carlin, they were saying they peel their ginger with a spoon. So that's, I think that might be a common way to do it also. Um, let's see, so Carlin was able to add her, um, the link in the chat right now, it's in there. If you want to, uh, that from the home to yours series, uh, culinary series, I believe. And uh, that video that she showed will be on that in a, in a couple weeks. So that was an excellent video. And I think you'll find others in that series that are going to be very helpful to you. Um, let's see. And Dr. Uh, Mersh, I think you answered a lot of the questions that people had about uh, containers and disease and spread of bacterial wilt, wilt and things like that. So um, unless you had anything else to add, I think it looks like you covered it there. Um, well, not really that much. I think, uh, yeah, most of most part is really covered. I'm glad to see how things are really done. Also, to see some other source of uh, 
see rhizomes from Hawaii from Anne's presentation. So, I mean, the basic thing is we can think about having a pathogen free seed rhizome on one hand, but uh, that doesn't really end the whole point of disease. So once we move them to the transplant or growback, so we should still anticipate that there are also other sources of the inoculum there and uh, we should think about holistically in general. Yeah. Very good. Uh, let's see. Um, well, let's see, maybe for Dr. Siddiqui or uh, Carlin or both, is there uh, any medical, uh, medicinal nutritional advantages to fresh ginger, a uh, fresh turmeric versus packaged turmeric? Uh, any ideas you all on that one or anybody else? Any, any advantages to the fresh turmeric versus a packaged product? I'm not really sure. Uh, I mean, fresh, you know, sounds good because, you know, it's all, everything is there. Um, we have not really done a study between fresh and the, uh, like, in a store um, uh, uh, ginger or turmeric. Um, but uh, as people use mostly the stored ones, I believe it's the same, you know, health benefits, what you get in the fresh one, is that in fresh one, you get more of a, you know, quality kind of things, like, like we found in baby ginger, when we it, uh, kind of harvested early, the phenolic contents are more, anti oxidation activity is more, it's just that, you know, in the mature, you can just use twice as much as the baby ginger. But uh, there may be certain other things which are maybe present in baby ginger or fresh ginger or turmeric, which are probably disappear in the store form. Uh, one thing could be the volatile compounds, which may be more preserved in the fresh one compared to the stored one, because as the time passes, the volatile compounds may get out. They may have certain health benefits. We are not sure yet, but uh, certainly, you know, uh, fresh would have more ad advantages compared to a stored one or mature one. Uh, but since majority of people use these mature stored one and still get health benefits, I would think there's not really much uh, difference probably. All right, very good. Um, well, with that, it seems like we've answered a lot of the questions that were here. And um, so I'll ask uh, Dr. Rafi, any closing words as we kind of finish up this workshop today? And it's been a, uh, we've been here. I thank everybody for staying on with us all this time and uh, a very, very good presentations. And so Dr. Rafi, any, anything to add? No, thank you, Chris, for, uh, for, for your uh, uh, leading the process, facilitating the process. I wanted to thank all of the speakers, ex excellent presentations and uh, those participants that decided to stay with us all the way to the end. And those that they left earlier, obviously, we need to thank them as well. But I appreciate everyone and, and, and uh, stay safe. Thank you. Well, that comes to the end of our presentation. Thank you all again. And if you right. want more thank you. you can uh, go ahead and, and contact us at VSU, and, uh, and we'll be glad to help you in any way we can. Well, thanks, everybody, and we'll, uh, we'll see you the next time. Okay, thanks, Chris.